Welcome to Prasco Park here in Mason, Ohio. This is a production of Chatterbox Sports for the Joe Nuxall Classic. It's time for Game 2 between the Xavier Musketeers and the Cincinnati Bearcats. Xavier coming in today with a 15-16 and 16 overall record. Cincinnati a little bit better at 19-13 and 13 on the season. These two teams were scheduled to play last week. Game got rained out. Here we are today for the Nuxall Classic, but this is not the first team, first time that these teams, excuse me, have met this year. Xavier picking up the win in their first meeting a little bit earlier in the season. But Musketeers have challenged themselves in the non-conference schedule as they usually do. They like to go south. They like to take those spring break trips, whether it's down south, out west, whatever it might be, play a challenging schedule. Cincinnati in their first year under their new head coach, Coach Bischel. There's a lot to this game tonight. We're going to talk about that more in just a second. Paul Fritschner, Reed Mouse, Trace Fowler here with you for this production. And uh, as we get started here, we're we'll talk about the game in just a second. We're going to talk about these teams. But if you're just joining us, you missed game one. We are live here from Prasco Park, and it is a beautiful facility. Everything is free, free food, free admission. We appreciate you watching, but if you want to come and be here, we'd love to have you here too because this is just such a nice event that this uh, facility is putting on this year. Trace, there's really nothing like it. Yeah, I mean, listen, I don't know if we've been blessed with the best day so far, but you know what? The sun is starting to try to come <laughs> hey, out. There it's it is. It, there it, it is. It does it's exist. Doing, it's doing its best. I think they're going to rip that tarp off. They just ripped it off. So we're going to get a chance to watch some, some local baseball at a beautiful facility, and one in which, quite frankly, if you've never been, you just need to find a way to get over here. And uh, it's for a plethora of reasons, quite frankly. Whether you like just the beautiful uh, aesthetics of the field, you love baseball, you love food, you love people, whatever it may be that you love, I'm sure they have it here <laughs> at Prasco Park because it's, uh, it's quite honestly – uh, above and beyond anything that I've ever seen. Yeah, it is all free. No matter what you want here, it is free. Reed, uh, these two teams here have had a lot of success in recent years as far as uh, you know, looking toward the postseason. Xavier coming off a regional tournament appearance last year. Cincinnati uh, has kind of come up and down in waves. Scott Guggins was a coach last year. Now it is Coach Bischel in his first season as the head man at Cincinnati. And it's been a good year so far for the Bearcats, coming off a pretty impressive few wins down there against TCU, a three-game winning streak for them off that sweep. Yeah, it, you mentioned it. I don't think anybody expected Coach Bischel in his first year in the Big 12, which I think is kind of slept on in, in yep. the college baseball ranks, to have the success that they've had, a sweep over TCU, a noted powerhouse in college baseball. That's what this team is. And, you know, going into the Big 12, first-year head coach, they're – They've been playing fantastic. A lot of local kids on this team. I know that's a major stride. I know that's a major point of emphasis for the Bearcats. They want to get um, kids local to the area, and you'll see a couple today. Um, and, and the part of that reason is is because of how much tradition we have here in southwest Ohio, the Cincinnati, Dayton areas. That's why this whole um, event even exists in the first place. Yeah, I was going to say, Reed, you make a great point. Trace, there is a lot of baseball talent, and you look at the high schools around here and the talent that we have in southwest Ohio. That's what makes this kind of an event even more special than it already was. Yeah, I mean, it starts from the from the grassroots, right? I think from a very early age, if you are uh, born within this community that is Southwest Ohio, the, the, there's a good chance you get introduced to baseball. There's a good chance that uh, in order for you to stop playing baseball, it's either one you don't like it, or perhaps somebody tells you that you're no longer good enough, which we which we all get told at some right, point. Right, we all right. get told at some point. But uh, but the beautiful thing is is that you're going to get a chance to see today some of that local talent at a collegiate level. And uh, you go to the state championships in Ohio, and there's a good chance that there's Southwest Ohio teams playing in it, which is uh, which is obviously why we're here yep. today to watch some beautiful baseball at Prasco Park. I gotta ask Paul. Yes. How are you going to be unbiased for, yeah, this, for you, this whole thing? Right, Paul. Yeah, right. This, I mean, this look, helmet right here. Right, is, look, is actually, that helmet. Let's almost make him wear that helmet to see if he'll even do it. I look, don't think you got. Here's what we it. got today, fellas. <laughs> <laughs> you, we got to be unbiased. You sit up here. It doesn't matter. You call the Xavier games during the year. You got to talk about both teams. Don't you worry about that. It's okay. How about I be biased? He's biased towards UC. I'm biased towards UC, and you can just be Xavier. All right. You know what? That's right, fine by me. Right. Fine by me. Well, the Xavier Musketeers. Let's get right into them. Yeah. Yeah. I I think while we're while we're talking about it, Xavier at 15 and 16 on the season. They're coming off a year last year where they went down to Vanderbilt. They played in the NCAA tournament, lost in the regional final to Oregon, lost a lot of talent, and have really suffered some injuries this year. You look at the outfield, 
all injured right now for Xavier as far as the starters coming into the season. So they've had to battle through a lot of that. But earlier in the season, they pick up maybe the best win in program history against, at the time, a second-ranked LSU team down at the box at LSU. Pro defending national champions, I would say probably the best win in the history of that program. Now, I know since then, LSU has struggled here over the last month or so. They're not quite the team that they were, maybe we were expecting to be coming into the season, but you want to talk about a marquee win. It feels like over the last few years, whether it's beating uh, a nationally ranked Kentucky team or whether it's going to LSU, Xavier is always good for one or two of those wins where you just think, well, okay, hold on, where'd that come from, from a program like this? But that is what Billy O'Connor, somebody who played at Xavier, was an assistant at Xavier for a long time, took over as the head coach in 2017 when Scott Guggins left and went to Cincinnati from Xavier. That's the kind of thing that he has instilled in this program. And now here they are. But playing here today, have a chance to go to 500 on the season. Yeah, listen, it's, Xavier has kind of been the surprise in, in, in Southwest Ohio over the, the past few years, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, obviously you see the bigger school, right? State's had the success that they've had, but Xavier's just been chugging along, and they've been a fantastic program. You mentioned it. Yeah. You, you, you've been with them yeah. all last year. You were down there in yeah. Nashville last year on the, the precipice of getting to that to that super regional, and they, they hope to get back to a yeah. similar game this year. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think the biggest thing right now for Xavier when you talk about – what this Xavier team is. It's always the pitching. Xavier feels like always has the lineup, but the pitching is the biggest question mark for this Xavier team. Luke Hoskins has been phenomenal over the course of his young career, but just trying to build it up in a stadium like Hayden Field where you hit a pop fly that in a lot of stadiums might be a, a quick little pop out to the shortstop. That thing's over Victory Parkway. That's just how it is, 310 down the lines. It's a bigger park here, 320 down the lines, but some higher fences. The ball can fly here at yes. Prasco. This is a hitter's park. Yeah, I mean, listen. Most of the time, uh, it, it's it's the uh, it's not the arrow, it's the Indian, as they say. I I, I think ultimately, at the end of the day, um, you know, fields and where you play at might get a little overblown. But a, a place like Xavier, where you have three ten down the line, yeah. you walk into the park. There's no doubt. <laughs> there's no doubt if the anybody's ever been a hitter, yeah. pick. you start staring at it a little bit longer than maybe you yeah. should. Sometimes that goes in, against your uh, against your psyche, though, and yep. it, it kind of can get you out of your sorts if you if you make that a big priority. But you know what? I'm just thankful the sun's out, Paul, right. and we got a chance to play some baseball. Here, here, here's the thing: all four of these teams playing today have fantastic facilities, right? Yep. All four schools have fantastic facilities. They get excited to play at Prasco Park. That's the kind of facility this place is, and uh, and, and I'm sure the coaches will, will tell you in a moment about, you know, what an opportunity this is. I mentioned this in the pregame show for our earlier game between Miami and Wright State, but this here was the facility for the alternate site for the Reds back in 2020, a good enough facility for the major leagues. That's what this park and this place means to the people of this area here in Mason. But we did have a chance to catch up with Xavier's head coach, Billy O'Connor. Let's take a listen to that right now. Joined now by Xavier head coach, Billy O'Connor, and Billy getting set here up at Prasco Park to take on the crosstown rival Cincinnati didn't get a chance to play them last week. Weather better this week. So just take us through what this matchup is like for you uh, overall. It's a rivalry for sure, you know, and throughout the city, uh, I think most people are either split up between Cincinnati or Xavier fans, and there's certainly a rivalry between us too. And, again, no no hard feelings like the guys over there, but uh, it's, it's a rivalry game. There's some bragging rights in the city, so it's an important game for us. For fans that are here at the stadium that are maybe watching your team for the first time today, take us through a few of your uh, impact players and what this means for you today here in this game. Sure. Start with some of our older guys. You know, Matt Dupre is an everyday guy behind the plate for us. It's uh, as consistent as it gets. Uh, sets a tone with us from a leadership standpoint. Jared Cushing at second base. Matt McCormick at first base. Grant Stevenson at shortstop. Um, you know, some guys that have been in the lineup for a long time and have been consistent contributors for us. So they know what uh, uh, this event, the Nuxall event, means. Uh, they know what a rivalry game with Cincinnati is about, and they're excited to play today. You've battled some injuries this year, especially out in the outfield. You've had to overcome some adversity, but still you able to go down to LSU, pick up a win. And, and, and now here you're getting into the heart of the Big East season. And I know this is a midweek non-conference game, but where do you find yourself at this point in the year? Yeah, we're hobbled a little bit. Um, we're a little bit shorthanded with some injuries, but so is everybody. Everybody's got things that they're dealing with, and you know, it's some adversity that we're, we're getting some guys some opportunities to go in there and get some chances that otherwise might not have. So no excuses to be made. Um, you know, we're battling right now. You know, we're trying to piece it together a little bit, but we're in a good spot. We've got some depth on our team, and it's being tested right now. But I'm excited for those guys to get the opportunity. Take us through the pitching today. 
Connor Bailey will start. Um, uh, he's, he's been around for a while as a senior for us. Uh, he's thrown some big games for us in the past. So excited for him to, to kind of get us into the game. And then you have Alex Vera, Nolan Hughes, Jonathan Kelly, Jake Lambden, uh, Tyler Sauceville. There's some of the, the names you'll probably see throughout the course of the game today. But, uh, you know, we'll piece it together. Again, it's not going to be anybody going six, seven innings. It's going to be two here, two there, and try to get us through through all nine. What does this event, the Joe Nuxall Classic, mean to this program, to these programs playing in this? It's such a cool thing to be a part of. You know, there's such a, a rich history of baseball in the city of Cincinnati and, uh, and such great baseball programs in the city of Cincinnati from a college standpoint. So to be able to pull everybody together uh, for this event and also to honor the, the, the legacy of Joe Nuxall and what a great inspiration he is to everybody that grew up in Cincinnati like myself, um, what he means to, to the city from a baseball standpoint, what he means on an off-the-field standpoint from uh, you know, his foundation that, that, that he, uh, he started. Uh, it, it's such a cool thing for our guys to be a part of, and it's such a cool event to be held at Prasco where, man, there's going to be three, four, five thousand 5,000 people here tonight to watch a game, and we're excited to be a part of it. Best of luck tonight, Billy. Thanks, Paul. That was Xavier's head coach, Billy O'Connor. Now let's take a listen to our conversation with Jordan Bischel, the first-year head coach over at the University of Cincinnati. Joined now by Cincinnati head coach Jordan Bischel. And Jordan, here in your first year as the head coach of the University of Cincinnati, you get to come up here to Prasco Park, a beautiful facility. What are your first impressions here at Prasco? Yeah, I've been down here recruiting before, and it's an amazing venue. I mean, what, what they've done to put together here, it's it's a really cool place for our guys to play and to be able to do it in our own backyard and have a lot of family and friends be able to come. Pretty pretty cool opportunity. You've already played Xavier once this season. What were your first impressions of them? I know the game didn't go the way that you all would have hoped, but... What do you take away from that in a game like this? Yeah, I think anytime Cincinnati and Xavier play, there's there's going to be a lot of intensity and a lot of energy, and, and that's good. That's great. It was it was a, a quality rivalry type game, back and forth game. We jumped out front. They can really score. They can really hit. Uh, but some talent on the mound too. Billy just does such a great job with the program. We know it's going to be a dogfight. What were your first impressions of the rivalry? As somebody coming in here now, your first season, this game, these two teams, they mean so much to each other and to this city. Yeah, obviously a, a lot of these kids know each other coming from this area, and so even though I'm not real familiar with the interaction, there's there's a lot within the program. And But I think it's a very respectful rivalry, too. I think we both respect each other's programs, and, and we're excited to compete. For fans that may be here at Prasco Park watching Cincinnati for the first time today, can you just walk us through the season so far and, and real fast and some of your uh, top players? Yeah, we, uh, we've started to play pretty well recently, swept TCU over the weekend, which obviously a really, really good national program, and so that was a big step for us. Now how we respond to it is going to matter, but uh, our top of the order has been really, really productive. Loudon Brooks done a great job in the leadoff spot, local kid. Uh, Josh Cross in the four hole has 12 home runs and 46 RBIs, so obviously a lot of thump there, but Tommy O'Connor and Carrington Cross at the top. Those top four have really stabilized that top, and then we're really deep on the bottom half of the order with some names changing spots, but a lot of guys that have have made big contributions on the mound uh, we'll see Brendan Garula to start today he's he's been tremendous for us another local guy who who's been in this area a long time so exciting to see him be successful and then we'll mix and match out of the pen a little bit as far as the pitching goes in a park like this where the ball can travel you see a lot of home runs in this facility even though the fence is not too short but it's still a pretty hitter friendly park so what do you tell you guys going into a game like you know, I think it goes back to pounding the strike zone. You know, you're probably going to give up some hard contact, maybe some home runs or extra base hits, but if those are, are one-run hits, it's not game-changing, but when they become those three-run shots, it, it's a problem. So really attacking the strike zone, getting the ball in play still is really, really important. Last question for you, Coach. Joe Nuxall means so much to this area, to this city, and this is a very special event that happens every year. Uh, what does it mean for you to be able to coach and participate in this event? Yeah, obviously I didn't know a whole lot about it coming in. Now, I was coaching in the MAC previously, so I always saw Miami, Ohio playing in it. And, and so learning about it and, and seeing what goes into it, it's just a first-class production that supports a great cause. Uh, really flattering to, to be one of the four teams that, that's able to be a part of it, and hopefully we can put on a good show for the fans tonight. Best of luck tonight, Coach. Thank you. Appreciate it. Great to hear from both of those coaches ahead of tonight's first pitch here at Prasco Park. When I don't think we can sign off of this show without talking about what sure. this game means, not only of in the in the Joe Nuxall Classic in the context of what we are here today, but obviously Xavier and Cincinnati on the basketball court, one of the best rivalries in the country. But I think the best thing about this rivalry is how secluded it is to Southwest Ohio. It feels like it's personal to our area. It feels like if you're from – Kansas or you're from Oklahoma or whatever and you've never heard of Xavier or you don't know much about Cincinnati you don't know to appreciate what this rivalry is you hear about 
Duke and, mm-hmm. and right, North right, Carolina. Right you hear about Kentucky and Louisville. You hear about those teams, and everybody knows those teams. But I think that that's what makes this special because of how personal it is to this area and how much it feels protected by this area. It's a lot of fun, and it doesn't just mean something big on the basketball court. It definitely means something big here on the baseball diamond because, as you talked about, Reed and Trace, these are two teams recruiting this area very strongly, especially Cincinnati. A lot of talent on the Cincinnati team from this area. And if you're consistently the team with the upper hand in this rivalry, well, a recruit might look at that program and say, hey, if you're deciding between the two, why not go to the one that wins? No no, no doubt about it. How – how much space separates four miles or something yeah, like that? Yeah, it's like three with a period or something. I don't know. Right. Yeah. It's, it, these two schools are so Decimal, close. what do they call it? Yeah. They play a lot over the season, right? A lot of yeah. midweek games, normally at least uh, two to three games. Yeah. A lot of them happen in here in the Nuxall Classic. But you're absolutely right. It, it's it's about more than just the two schools. It's about bragging rights, yes. right? It's about saying like, hey, remember last year when, when we, we swept UC? Remember last year when we swept Xavier? They yep. remember those things long after their college baseball career is over. Yeah, yeah. let's face it. Midweek games usually, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, it's a, it's a way to prepare yourself for the weekend. It's a way to kind of keep the momentum mm-hmm. building. But, you don't, you know, it might not be do or die. I'm not suggesting for a single second they're going to exhaust every, every, every person in the pen today. But let's not also act like this is just your normal midweek game. It's got a little more buzz to it. It's got a little more excitement to it. And, you know, you know what they say about rivalries, guys. They just You just throw the record. Take that record. Is this book? a record book? Just throw it out. Throw it out. Just throw it out. Throw it out. But here's the thing. Prasco Park does everything above and beyond as they know top tier this is the first time i don't know if you know this gentlemen but they're not playing for this hardware this year because they're because of the rain out but here soon this thing's a monster by the way i don't know if this is going to go i'm just going to put it in front of my face that's so big it looks uh, better that way it probably does <laughs> but my my point is is that you do have something to play for now not only do you have for bragging rights but at some point when they when the weather uh, does what it's supposed to do and not rain on top of you, uh, and you can finish this uh, the Joe Nuxall Classic, you'll be able to put your name right here in the front. And you know what the best thing about this trophy is that I just realized uh, before we came on? Yeah, it's got a it's got a nice set of all four schools littered throughout it. It's not yeah. just dominated by one school. It's uh it's it's a good competition. And then of course you got the old left hander on the right. top, that's that's the old Joe Nuxall. That's why we're here today. Yep. So that is the pregame here for Xavier and Cincinnati coming up the first pitch in just a minute. Thank you for watching here on Chatterbox Sports. We'll send you off to the broadcast. The Xavier Musketeers and the Cincinnati Bearcats here from production of Chatterbox Sports and the Joe Nuxall Classic. So when it comes to prescription drugs, why don't you have a choice? Sure, you've got brand name drugs, but those can get expensive. And then there's regular generics, which are safe and effective, but may not be exactly the same as brand name. Why don't you have another option? Meet Authorized Generics, a unique class of generic drugs approved by the FDA, identical to the brand name, and made of the same active and inactive ingredients as the brand name. Unlike regular generics, which are manufactured by a different company and often have different inactive ingredients, which could result in a different experience. Authorized generics are identical to brand name drugs because they're made with the same exact formula, most often made in the same exact manufacturing facility to give you the same exact texture, taste, size, smell, and feel as the brand name drugs. 
It's all legit and always FDA approved. Look, when it comes to what you take, you deserve a choice. And you have one. Ask your pharmacist if there's an authorized generic version of your prescription today. Identical to brand name, affordable to you. AuthorizedGenerics.com Good evening and welcome to Prasco Park in Mason, Ohio. This is the Joe Nuxhall Classic on Chatterbox Sports. Here with Zach Siegel, I'm Anthony Mazzini. Glad you can join us today. The nightcap of this Joe Nuxhall Classic, Miami took down Wright State in a marathon game, 22 to 21 earlier today. And now the Cincinnati Bearcats take on the Xavier Musketeers. Starting lineup for the Bearcats coming off a weekend sweep against TCU. Loudon Brooks at short, Tommy O'Connor at first. Carrington Cross at third, Josh Cross behind the plate. Josh Hegeman, the left fielder, Luke Sefcik at second. Hunter Jesse, the DH, Dalton Pearson in center, and Landon Vitterick in right. And that starting lineup for Cincinnati faces Connor Bailey on the mound for the Xavier Musketeers. And Bailey making his third start of the year's 13th appearance overall, a 4.95 ERA coming into today's midweek start. So, Zach, kind of two teams that are trending in two different directions. Xavier on the season below 500, lost to UConn this past weekend, their first non or their first conference series. Cincinnati, you couldn't be on much more of a high if you tried for the Bearcats right now. Absolutely, the Bearcats coming off a three game sweep of the preseason Big 12 favorite TCU. An absolutely massive series for the Bearcats. And as you touched on conversely, Xavier just getting started with their conference games in the Big East, one and two against a good UConn team. But don't let that 15 and 16 record for the Musketeers fool you. They're ranked right now number 33rd RPI, and that's due to such a strong strength of schedule early, earlier in the year. Nam Conference series against Clemson, Florida Gulf Coast, LSU, Indiana State, midweeks against Louisville, Louisiana Tech. This is a good Xavier ball club. So Connor Bailey on the bump today. He'll face Loudon Brooks, first batter of the game. What stands out about Connor Bailey? Connor Bailey's a guy that's got really good stuff. We see the strikeouts and walks both up there. Has not given up a ton of hits or hard contact. It's just going to be whether or not he's in the zone. Well, the first pitch from the tall right-hander. This is down and in. We're underway. 6.30 first pitch tonight. The game was originally pushed up to 5 o'clock. And that was due to inclement weather expected in the area. It's so far, so good. Everything has held off. But when the Wright State Miami game went long, this game was now pushed to 6.30. Hot shot picked over at third by Hammond, and that is out number one. So Hammond plays third today. Stevenson at short, Jared Cushing, who's been on a roll at the plate, he plays second, and Matt McCormick at first. Left to right in the outfield, Christensen, Hendrickson, and Anderson. So all of the Suns are in the outfield today. And Matthew Dupre does the catching for the Musketeers. One up and one down for Tommy O'Connor. Good start for Bailey. O'Connor sends a fly ball out to right field. Anderson drifting back at the wall, feeling for it, and it hits the wall. O'Connor digging for two. He gets the wave, chugging for three. And Tommy O'Connor has a triple. Gets an off-speed pitch over the middle of the zone and continues to do what Tommy O'Connor has done all year. Drives the ball with authority into the gaps. Really good read coming around second base. He sees the ball squirted off the wall and actually went back in front of the center fielder and made a good read and was looking triple all the way. His first triple of the season. The guy that came in batting 308 on the year is one for one with a three bagger to open up his day today and now Carrington Cross at the plate. Cincinnati trying to strike in the first inning. On the ground, picked again, nicely done by Hammond. He's been busy and on target to start this game. Hammond must have been over during the delayed start time playing wall ball because he's looking smooth over there at third. A couple of 100 mile an hour shots to him to start off this game. Yeah, two outs in this inning for Cincinnati, Zach, but the Bearcats have really squared it up against Connor Bailey. 
Three batters, three hard hit balls. And here's Josh Cross, one of the hotter hitters in the Big 12 right now. Well, this Bearcats lineup has seen Bailey this season. Bailey actually picked up the win on February 27th against the Bearcats. Pitched two and a third innings, allowed a run. In a game that the Musketeers came back to win against Cincinnati, the Muskies were down six runs in the middle innings. But Xavier scored eight in the sixth inning. Came back to win that game. Cross up the middle, falling fast, and a base hit. So Cincinnati on the board in the first inning. Josh Cross, one of the nation's leaders in runs batted in, adds his 47th of the year. Josh Cross continues to do just a great job, not selling out for home runs, as the power numbers indicate, but gets what the, does what the pitcher gives and punches a nice base hit up the middle. Cross was 11th in the country at runs batted in, and he makes it 1-0 Cincinnati. Josh Hegeman takes low. Anthony, you touched on that game in late February between the Musketeers and the Bearcats, and that was one that the Bearcats felt like they were in control and kind of let it slip away. So they've got a bad taste in their mouth, and despite that three-game sweep of TCU, these games against Xavier always mean something. Well, I was going to ask you that. You've played in this rivalry. How much extra weight does this carry? It carries a ton of weight. Just the city of Cincinnati, everybody thinks the Crosstown shootout, but Xavier and UC always have this great rivalry, regardless of sport, and especially the Bearcats. A ton of local guys, including Josh Hegman right here, Baden High School. This means something. Fastball called the strike. Two balls and a strike on Hegeman, hitting 376 on the year. One of the best in the Big 12. More on that rivalry. Two years ago, I actually got to start the game at Prasco, UC versus Xavier, and I remember being about as juiced for that as I was in my whole career. What was it like playing here at Prasco Park? Seems like a, a beautiful facility. I mean, you cannot ask for much more when it comes to, first of all, the pristine condition of the playing surface in the field and just the way that they run this operation. It is just baseball heaven around here. Fans, free attendance, free concessions. Great place to watch a game and also to play. Two and two, the runner at first is Cross. And the pitch from Bailey. Sliced out to left and a base hit for Hegeman. It's now four games in a row with a base hit for Josh Hegeman. And the third hit of this first inning off of Connor Bailey. Josh Hegeman just does so many things right. He plays a fantastic defense. He's not going to blow you away with the power numbers. No home runs on the year. But just continues to hit. 376 batting average coming into this game. An on-base percentage close to 500. He is such a huge part of this Bearcats offense. May be overlooked at times. Bearcats have come out swinging. Pitch down to Sefcik. And this was an interesting development, Zach. Luke Sefcik is playing second base today. Loudon Brooks, who led off with the ground out to third is playing shortstop. And that's a new alignment for Cincinnati, but Jordan Bischel really likes Sefcik's back. They're trying to get him into the lineup a little bit more. So putting Brooks at short today. Very interesting to see. We've seen mostly Christian Mitchell playing shortstop this year. We've seen some Cam Guidry. We've seen a little bit of Max Palmieri, but Loudon Brooks in his Bearcat career has not played shortstop at all. So making his first slide over to the left side of the infield. And it makes sense. You need Sefcik and Brooks' bats both in this lineup. Popped up, he gets under it off of third base. Hammonds doesn't have a play. Now, Sefcik has been scuffling a little bit lately. 0 for 7 between the Baylor and TCU series. But his playing time had gone down a little bit, with Brooks really taking command of that second base spot. So Jordan Bischel trying to find the right balance of getting Sefcik in there consistently as well as keeping Brooks in there. That's what's great about these midweek games, just a good opportunity, even as we're a good chunk into the season, to give coaches a chance to find that right rotation. Now fouled right off of Matthew Dupre, the catcher. Two balls and two strikes on Sefcik, who came over following Jordan Bischel, the first-year head coach for Cincinnati from Central Michigan. 
Mac first team selection a season ago. Bailey deals the 2-2. And Sefcik shoots it out to short. It eats up the shortstop, Stevenson. Ricochets into left. Here comes Cross. And it is 2-0, Cincinnati. Got the in-between hop and was just stuck in the middle there. The Bearcats continue to do what they do offensively. They're going to put the ball in play, put pressure on the defense. We've talked so much this year, Anthony, calling UC's home games about just the way that they refuse to strike out and make things easy for the, for the pitchers. They're just going to put it in play and good things happen. They give Sefcik the benefit of the doubt there. They score that a hit. So an RBI knock, fourth hit of the inning, and Jesse takes strike one. A guy that has not played in this rivalry against Xavier, but he's very familiar with playing a lot of these Joe Nuxall classic teams coming over from Indiana. Spent four years with the Hoosiers. They also play a lot of these local area schools. I'll do you one better, Anthony. Hunter Jesse, a Prasco Park legend, I remember watching a game here, his Kings High School, as he, when he was a junior against the Mason Comets, he ended up stealing home to win a big game against the rival Comets back in 2018. So he's no stranger to doing great on this field. What a catch it short. Stevenson leaping high and coming down with it. Unreal play by Grant Stevenson robbing Jesse of a base hit. And what a stellar play to end the top of the first inning, but Cincinnati strikes twice and gives Brendan Garula, the starting pitcher, some early run support. First inning, Xavier coming up for the first time in this second game of the Joe Nuxall Classic. And Billy O'Connor sends this group out there, one through nine. Luke Hammond playing third base, Connor Mish, the DH. Matt McCormick at first, Hayden Christensen in left. Matthew Dupre, the catcher. Jared Cushing at second. Carter Hendrickson at center. Aiden Anderson in right. Grant Stevenson made that fine play at shortstop to end the top of the first inning. Against Brendan Garula who's been one of the best arms out of Cincinnati's bullpen, and he's even making some starts now for Cincinnati. Made the weekend start on Friday as an opener and draws the midweek start again today. That's right. This is actually his fifth start. He got a couple midweek opportunities earlier in the year, and his role has just continued to expand. We've seen him as the Friday night starter, Friday night opener more like the last two weeks. Done a great job setting the table for Seth Logue, who was the Friday night starter, but he's been in a long relief setting. And now they're going to continue to ride the hot hand as Garula, 1.84 ERA on the season, has just been huge for this Bearcat staff, who has been in desperate need of people to step up after a rough start on the mound to the season. Four of the last five appearances have been scoreless for Garula, who tied his season high three and two thirds against TCU on Friday. Pitch to Luke Hammond is taken for a strike, hitting 278, seven home runs and 19 batted in. You'll hear a lot of high home run totals for this Musketeers group. The last few years, they have really emphasized hitting home runs and they've done it well. Absolutely, Anthony. Whenever in my career I pitched against Xavier, whether it was at our place or at theirs, it was always an emphasis on 
keeping the ball down and knowing that they're going to be very free swinging. Chopped foul at the dish. Hammond down one and two. Well, Hammond's been at the top of the lineup the last couple of weeks. He had been more of a middle of the order bat early in the year, but Billy O'Connor moving him up and with good results. Had a two for four game on Sunday against UConn, a one nothing loss against the Huskies. UConn won two of those three games. Preseason favorites in the Big East. Xavier picked to finish second. His first action in the Joe Nuxall, and he's a local guy from Indian Hill, so loves to set the tone at the top of this Musketeers order in a game that means something. And he's off to a good start today. Base hit to left. Well, he made a couple of good plays in that first inning on hot shots over to third, and he starts one for one. That brings in Connor Mish. Been playing very well as of late. Enters today with a 13 game on base streak for the Musketeers. Hitting 294 overall. Mish puts together a nice series at UConn, including a home run, four hits over the three games. Really starting to heat up, as you said, providing a big spark in the middle of this Xavier order. Quickly nothing in two. We see Garula continue to do what he's done all year, just pitch unpredictably, fastball, curveball, change up, pretty e even distribution of all those pitches. Buries that one, good stop from Cross, but it squirts away enough for Hammond to advance. Good dirt ball read to get into scoring position. So Mish, who's had a nice sophomore season after hitting 260 last year, a chance to drive in Xavier's first run. What's been the biggest adjustment or the biggest change in Garula for a guy that only appeared in a handful of games last year and now one of the main arms, maybe the main arm in Cincinnati's rotation? I think it is all confidence. This is a guy who was the Ohio Pitcher of the Year out of Mason High School. Last year got roughed up in typical fashion as a freshman. Making the transition to college is never easy, and I think a lot of the time freshman has a couple bad outings and they start to lose that confidence that got them to the Division I level in the first place. But this year, he has just gotten back to that confidence that's always made him who he was. He's not going to overpower you, but he's going to pitch like he's got 95 in his pocket. Dots that one perfectly for strike three. First strikeout for Garula. Another thing with Garula, last year I think he got afraid to use his fastball. It's going to be 85 to 88. Again, not going to blow you away, but I think he was worried with that velocity that wouldn't play to college hitters. but. It's absolutely paramount to establish that fastball to break your off speed off of it. And this year, he's really been doing a better job of that. Starts off the big slugger, Matt McCormick, with a slider outside. Very imposing hitter in this Xavier lineup. This is a guy that pitchers are never happy to see walking the plate. Similar to Josh Cross, and always a power threat. Puts together a really nice career. Had a big year last year and already off to a hot start this year with 10 home runs. And hitting 296. Big East preseason team selection. Drove in three runs against Cincinnati on February 27th as part of a one for four day. There's not been a single game this year, Zach, where McCormick has not been on base. He's reached base in all 31 games. No surprise there. This is a guy that's played a lot of high level baseball. Started his career at West Virginia. 2020 and 2021. And he smokes this right center field, but it is caught by Vitterick. He got a great jump on that. Ball was torched and allowed out number two. McCormick doing what he does. Anything over the heart of the plate, he's going to drive with authority. But definitely an interesting case. As I was saying, those two years at West Virginia, didn't play at all in 2022. He was retired and then 
comes back last year for Billy O'Connor's Musketeers for only his junior year, although he was he's 24 now in his fourth year, but has played a lot of good baseball and one of the leaders of this Musketeers club. Fouled off to the right by Hayden Christensen. This was one of the stars in that first series or that first game against Cincinnati. He was three for five with three doubles. Sophomore for, from Spring Grove, Illinois. Now Garula one out away from working out of the leadoff single jam. Christensen hitting 293, five home runs. It's turned into a nice evening here in Mason, Ohio. Sun's starting to peek through the clouds. Again, this game was supposed to be at six. They moved it up to five with the expectation of some potentially inclement weather. But then the Miami Wright State game featured 43 runs, more than 40 hits. So this game started an hour and a half late and a half an hour late compared to the usual start time. Good pitch there. Two and two. That game one today was nuts. An absolute football score. We saw Sammy Sass for Wright State four for four with four home runs. Have a day. Ben Vore a, a double short of the cycle, but they ended up losing to the Reds to the Red Hawks, who just would not let up. Big comeback victory. Yeah, Wright State was down eight nothing. Ended up losing the game. How often do you have somebody hit four home runs? Another player hit two home runs, and as you mentioned, a double shy of the cycle, and you lose. That's that's midweek baseball for you. You often see a lot of younger pitchers being used in these games, and that typically will foster some high-scoring games, such as this earlier one that you had the good fortune of calling. Well, in that game, it wasn't just young pitchers, Zach. It was any pitcher, anybody that could throw a strike. So many pitching changes. They were going to have to start plucking people out of the stands. One of the crazier games I've been in attendance of. Payoff pitch. And it is outside. Christensen works the walk. A two on with two out. That's a great at bat from Christensen. That just highlights one of his stats this year. That's his 12th walk of the year. He only has 12 strikeouts, so he just does not punch out. Didn't give in there. Garula threw him a great curveball that he went and chased, but then he doesn't give in to the high fastball there. Fantastic at bat. A good chance for Dupre. 289 hitter. Having less of a power year this year. Hit 14 home runs a season ago, made 64 starts as part of a Big East first team selection with just two home runs this year. Good spot, one and one. This is a Musketeers lineup just riddled with veterans, fourth years and fifth years who have been here before. This team's been playing together for a long time. Tons of confidence. And you have to imagine, Zach, that's what made Billy O'Connor confident enough to go out and schedule Louisiana Tech, FGCU, Clemson, Louisville, LSU, Indiana State. Absolutely, especially coming off that Nashville regional appearance last year. This program just seems like they're starting to finally reach their potential. Certainly plenty of hitters in this lineup, but Xavier lost a lot on the pitching side of things. Good slider, and the count is full. The biggest key coming into this season, especially in Big East play, is will Xavier pitch enough? They lost Justin Lohr, their closer. Ethan Bosacker, one of their starters. Brent Aslis, another one of their starters. Cut and a miss. And the starter for Cincinnati, Brendan Garula, strikes out two in the first inning. Leaves a couple on, and it is 2-0 Bearcats after one at Prasco. So when it comes to prescription drugs, why don't you have a choice? 
sure, you've got brand name drugs, but those can get expensive. And then there's regular generics, which are safe and effective, but may not be exactly the same as brand name. Why don't you have another option? Meet Authorized Generics, a unique class of generic drugs approved by the FDA, identical to the brand name, and made of the same active and inactive ingredients as the brand name. Unlike regular generics, which are manufactured by a different company and often have different inactive ingredients, which could result in a different experience. Authorized generics are identical to brand name drugs because they're made with the same exact formula, most often made in the same exact manufacturing facility to give you the same exact texture, taste, size, smell, and feel as the brand name drugs. It's all legit and always FDA approved. Look, when it comes to what you take, you deserve a choice. And you have one. Ask your pharmacist if there's an authorized generic version of your prescription today. Identical to brand name, affordable to you. AuthorizedGenerics.com Nice job of pitching from Brendan Garula. Bottom of the first inning to work around a hit and a walk. So still 2-0 Cincinnati. After one inning of play here at Prasco Park in the second game of the Joe Nuxhall Classic. Miami beat Wright State earlier today. Connor Bailey back on the mound, his second inning of work, drawing a start against the Bearcats in the midweek. What does he have to do, Zach, to put up a zero here in the second after allowing the two runs in the first inning? Well, based on how the Bearcats offense has been swinging it, seven batters and seven hard contact, seven instances of hard contact, I should say. It seems like not throw it over the plate. The Bearcats are just crushing anything. 8-9-1 for the Bearcats here, starting with Dalton Pearson. Pearson hitting 204. First year in Cincinnati, coming over from Georgia State. He's been a staple out in center field. Known more for the glove than the bat this year. Bailey's got a really good fastball. It's just been at times if his curveball, if he's able to either land it for a strike or to consistently spin it well. Sometimes you see it back up over the heart of the plate, just left kind of hanging. Called strike two. And a swing and a miss. Pearson goes down. First strikeout for Bailey. Good sequence there from Bailey, pitching with no fear. Despite the Bearcats, a lot of hard contact in the first inning. That's what it's going to take. The Bearcats have really adopted this approach of not chasing out of the zone much, so opposing pitchers have to come right at him in the zone. Uh, one up and one down for Viterick. Getting the start in right field today. Viterick has hit a little bit of a slide, hitless in his last five games. He had a five game hitting streak before that. Socks it out to center field, sending Hendrickson back. Shy of the wall, he's got it. Viterick put a charge into it. Nothing to show for it, and he is out number two. Anybody who watched this first game, and Anthony, yourself included, knows that the ball is really carrying here today at Prasco Park. Viterick didn't even really seem to barrel that, and that nearly got to the warning track. Yeah, the wind is blowing out to left. Although we did see Ty Bodicic hit one out to right for Miami in game one. But definitely a righty-friendly park today inside on Brooks. Brooks started the game with a ground out to third. Brooks is eighth in the Big 12 with a 364 batting average. He's had a great year. 
taken such a huge step from last year offensively. Just seems like last year struck out looking a good amount. Just didn't look as confident at the plate. And this year, he just oozes confidence at the top of this Bearcats lineup. Works good at bats. Will bunt. Puts the ball in play. It's been a great table setter as of late for Jordan Bishop's club. Brooks is hitting 372 since March 20th. Hit safely in 14 of the past 15 games. That includes seven extra base hits, 11 runs batted in. Flies this out to right center. Anderson scooting over. And it is a 1-2-3 second inning for Bailey. Nice job of bouncing back after allowing the two runs in the first. One at a time again. Frank Robinson, Ken Griffey Jr., or Joey Bonner. Carson Marsh into the game for Cincinnati. So one inning effort for Brendan Garula. And early on, it's following a script of the first game of rolling out pitchers one at a time. Bailey with the first two for Xavier, but now Carson Marsh is in after just one inning for Brendan Garula. And Carson Marsh. Into the game, making his 14th appearance. He has a 4.63 ERA. 24 strikeouts in 23 and a third innings for the right-hander. Bearcats starters were so good this weekend, we didn't see Carson Marsh, who's been a big key bullpen piece for Jordan Bischel's squad, so no surprise to see him here early. And as you said, he has really picked it up as of late, gotten that ERA down in the mid-fours near the top of the team in appearances with now his 14th, actually tied with Brendan Garula for most appearances on the team. Just has been big time as a freshman. And I want to draw some attention, the strikeout to walk ratio as a freshman, 24 punch outs to just seven walks, really looks polished for a young arm. Out of Westchester, Ohio, uh, Ohio he pitched at Moeller High School, which is a notable program here in the Cincinnati region. Yeah, Marsh hasn't appeared in a week and a half now. Last against Baylor. Easter weekend went two and a third, allowed three runs against the Bears. Before that, he pitched two scoreless innings against St. Louis. Well, it's been a while. As you mentioned, Zach, a lot of really good success on the mound. Cincinnati didn't need to use many pitchers. This one's flied out to center off the bat of Jared Cushing. And that is a rare out for Cushing lately. He has been absolutely tearing the cover off the baseball, but flies out to center there for out number one. You said it, the fifth year Cushing, two hits each day in that UConn series, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, multi-hit days. Been a tough out as of late, but Marsh goes right at him with a fastball. That brings in Carter Hendrickson, playing center field today. And he goes after the first one. Shallow center, Sefcik is out there. And he's got it. Quick two outs for Marsh. I've been so impressed with Marsh's ability just to go right at hitters. Early in the year, gave up a walk-off home run in the very first game of the season down at Jacksonville State. And it might not seem like a huge deal, but that could be something that could really mess with the freshman's confidence. His first career outing, first game of the season, gives up a walk-off bomb, but I've been impressed by his ability to respond. He touched on the rough outing at Baylor, but here he is going right at guys. Called strike one on Aiden Anderson. 
Had a good game on Friday against the Huskies. One for four with a triple and two runs batted in. From Laguna Niguel, California. Bounced on the ground out towards second. Sefcik charges and retires the side. Nice inning from Carson Marsh. One, two, three, sending the Muskies down in order. Joe Nuxall Miracle League Fields, a place where every individual with every challenge gets every chance to play the game of baseball. Help us keep the legacy of the old left-hander going strong. To learn more or to support our mission, visit NuxallMiracleLeague.org or find us on Facebook. 2-3-4 coming up for Cincinnati, top of the third inning. Anthony Mazzini, Zach Siegel with you from the nightcap of the Joe Nuxhall Classic. Honoring the former Cincinnati Red, who was the youngest ever major leaguer to debut. He was 15 years old. Went on to become a renowned broadcaster in the Reds booth. And this tournament featuring Miami, Cincinnati, Xavier, and Wright State is played in his memory. A little bit different this year. Usually it's a two-week event. They would crown a champion. Xavier's actually won the last two years. But the first iteration was rained out a couple of weeks ago. So just a one-day event this year. There will be no trophy, unfortunately. Connor Bailey starts off. Tommy O'Connor with a strike. Good pitch. After the big fella tripled in his first at bat. Nasty slider. Bailey continues to go to this tight, short slider. Really plays well off the fastball, similar to uh, Nate Taylor's slider, who had a gem against TCU on Sunday of the series. What a catch at third. Hammond leaping up. That got sure on him quickly. Some action over there. He sure Goodness. is. Wowzers. Well, he had to be ready for that in a heartbeat. Their cat's continuing to hunt these fastballs. Lots of hard contact off of Bailey, but to his credit, a great bounce back one, two, three inning last inning. Like to see him continue to go back to that hard slider. Breaking ball dropped in on Carrington Cross. <laughs> Quickly nothing and two. Cross is great at getting on base, top 10 in the Big 12 and on base percentage and walks. It's led to a lot of runs this year. Been batting more in the middle of the lineup lately. Fights that off to the right. When you're this far into the season, Anthony, and you've got more walks than strikeouts, that is always a great sign. And Carrington Cross, 29 walks to 27 strikeouts. He touched on the on base, 487. I'm no mathematician, but that's nearly half the time he's getting on base. That was pretty well done for a guy that's not a mathematician. I appreciate it. My business degree is good for something. Cross had a good game against Xavier earlier this year, two for four. Drove in four runs. That game was played on February 27th at Hayden Park. These teams will meet again next week. Part of the regularly scheduled midweek game. 
Weekly hit, bouncer, first baseline, it stays fair. Out from the crouch, Dupre makes the play. Nicely done by Matthew Dupre, and he is responsible for the second out of this inning. Another good sequence from Connor Bailey. I'm liking the way that he's pitching the second and third inning, starting these hitters off with a heavy dose of sliders, then mixing in the fastball up in the zone or in for more of an out pitch. I think that's going to be his bread and butter when he pitches off that slider. Time called by Dupre. There's a, a divot right next to home plate where Cross hit that ball. Now they'll clean home plate while he's there. Working on a divot right next to the plate. You, you need one of those golf divots <laughs> to, to fix that up. They don't make those for baseball. I don't use that much because you have to hit the green to be able to use those. <laughs> it's a fair point. Actually, it was such a nice day yesterday. I got my first swings of the year. Went out to the driving range. There you go. Yeah, it went better than I expected. I was going to ask. Granted, you're not putting a ball in a hole. <laughs> you're just hitting it but certainly better than I would have thought. Sometimes you take some time off, you get out of your own head. Yeah, give me a month. <laughs> <laughs> Two and zero on Josh Cross. Not the guy you want to be down in the count to. <laughs> Fly ball, shallow right. Anderson started back, now he has to race in. But plenty of time to recover and make the play. It's another 1-2-3 inning for Bailey. He's retired seven in a row, going back to the first. Joe Nuxall Miracle League Fields, a place where every individual with every challenge gets every chance to play the game of baseball. Help us keep the legacy of the old left-hander going strong. To learn more or to support our mission, visit NuxallMiracleLeague.org or find us on Facebook. Bottom of the third inning. Here in Mason, Ohio, Prasco Park, the site of the Joe Nuxall Classic. Carson Marsh back out there after a very quick and effective second inning. Retired the Musketeers, 1-2-3. And he will face 9-1-2. and two. Bottom of the third. Anthony, we talked about Joe Nuxall earlier, a bit of his career. Every time I hear that, hear that stat about him pitching in the bigs at 15, Unbelievable. I could barely walk and chew gum when I was 15. Well, of course, a different game back then, and he was debuting at a time when so many players were deployed due to World War II, and there was a need for baseball players. So it was a different day and age, a different game. But however you draw it up, very impressive. What might be even more impressive is when he was debuting, when players were needed due to military service, you had people that were signing up to enlist at that age and trying to get in earlier than they were allowed. Crazy. It was a different generation back then. You hear stories of 13, 14, 15, 16-year-olds going up to Army offices to enlist, telling them that they're 18 <laughs> just so they can go overseas. Different generation. The only thing I probably lied about my age about was to play the Call of Duty game. So that's that's kind of the same thing, right? Two balls and a strike on Stevenson. Yeah, that, that's about the same, I'd say. Stevenson, one of those key returners you talked about earlier, Zach, this 
veteran-laden team. All-conference second team a year ago. He was on the preseason team coming into this season, but it has been a tough stretch for him, hitting just 167. And he goes down looking to begin the third. First strikeout for Carson Marsh. Well, back to the top of the order now for Luke Hammond. Cincinnati pitching has retired five in a row. Xavier will be back playing at this field, they hope, at the end of the season in the Big East Tournament. Top four teams in the Big East at the end of the year qualify. And Xavier, if they make the top four, they are a very likely candidate to get to the championship. Every single time they have qualified for the tournament, they've gone to the championship series. They won it last year over UConn. As you mentioned earlier, Zach went to the NCAA Regional down in Nashville and put up a pretty good fight. Beat Vanderbilt, ended up losing to an, a good Oregon team twice who would come out of that Regional in Nashville. But 39-25 and 25 last year, certainly no slouch and no surprise why they, they played such a great strength of schedule and their year last year that, as I said earlier, they're ranked number 33 RPI, which for a Big East team under 500, pretty crazy. Hot shot picked by Cross at third. Boy, he's gotten better defensively over the last couple of weeks. And makes a nice strong throw over for out number two. I had a feeling that Hammond was going to hit one over there as he was getting a lot of action early. We've seen some fantastic defense in the hot corner on both sides of the ball today. Again, the biggest difference this season for Xavier is the pitching. Coming into today, a 6-3-9 team ERA. The bats are still there. Question is, can this team pitch enough down the stretch? They showed it against UConn. It's kind of funny. They won the first game of the series 9-5, to five, and then they just couldn't hit the final two games. One that, to nothing game on Sunday. I was just about to say. You know, for a team that's supposed to be very good offensively and not pitch very well, they really showed out. As you said, they lost some key pieces. Ethan Bosacker. He was nasty last year for the Musketeers, 98 innings pitch. I mean, that's a lot to make up for, not to mention Justin Lower, who made the flip to a very good LSU team. He's been a big piece of their bullpen down in Baton Rouge. And Bosecker, the 3-4-9 ERA last year. Swing and a miss. And Carson Marsh makes quick work of the Xavier Musketeers in the third inning. Strikes out a pair. And Bearcats pitching has been cruising the last couple innings.
The day is done for Connor Bailey. He worked the first three innings for the Musketeers, gave up two runs in the first, and really settled in after that. But now he gives way to so uh, Tyler Sauceville. Transfer from New Haven. Sophomore from Schenectady, New York. He was a good one last year in the NE10. All-conference third team, rookie team, pitcher of the year. 3-3-3 ERA a season ago at New Haven. And he's been just about the same, if not even better, considering the jump in competition. 4-8 ERA in his eighth appearance now this season. Bearcats did see the left-hander on February 22nd in the Xavier win. One inning, two hits, two walks, two strikeouts, three runs. So we'll see if he can turn the tables on the Bearcats this time. Now Sauceville will face Hegeman, Sefcik, and Jesse. So Billy O'Connor bringing in the lefty against a couple of southpaws. Hegeman gets drilled. First pitch out of the hand of Sauceville, and the leadoff man is on. Not the start that Billy O'Connor was hoping for, bringing Sauceville out of the pen. First time a Bearcats batter's reached base since the first inning. Bringing a little life back in the dugout as it had gotten a bit quiet with all those zeros. Luke Sefcik takes strike one. Good slider. Sweeps into the zone, started in the other batter's box and clipped the corner there. Flied out towards right, but out of play. And quickly, nothing in two on Sefcik, the second baseman today for Cincinnati. Sauceville bounced around between rotation and bullpen last year at New Haven. Coming out of the pen this year with the Musketeers. Held opponents to a 170 batting average. Of course, a significant jump in competition going from New Haven to Cincinnati, uh, excuse me, to Xavier. But he's handled himself pretty well. He's set. Long stare and the one two. Reach and a foul down the right field line. What's the biggest difference, Zach? When you, I, I know you never did it, but what do you know about the biggest differences from jumping up a level like Sauceville did? What's the biggest thing you have to adjust to? I would say it just has to do with the quality of hitters you're going to be facing one through nine. At lower conferences, lower divisions, you're still going to have dudes one through four, one through five, but it's those six through nine when, similar to going from high school to college, you know, it's just the lower levels, you're not going to have that consistency in the bottom third of the order. Whereas we see a Bearcats team who's had a lot of production at the bottom of the order. Still 60 feet 6 inches, still the same game, just can't take any ABs off at this level. Well, you see so many guys that get overlooked and end up at that D2, D3 level, NAIA. Juco level. Baseball is really that one sport where it seems more interchangeable than others. You know, basketball, there is a significant jump Big going time. level to level. Sauceville's an undersized guy, just five foot seven, but love to see a guy like him. Probably has a real chip on his shoulder. He can really pitch, and as you said, probably overlooked due to his size, but. Now getting a good opportunity to Xavier team. It's got a good chance to make a regional again this year. He 
he's part of that revamped staff for Billy O'Connor. As we talked about losing all that pitching. Their big loss with the bat was Andrew Walker. Hit 325 last year. Cincinnati lost a big one as well, Ryan Nicholson, who's now playing at Kentucky, a top 25 team. Nicholson last year hit 16 home runs, just shy of 300. Fouled off, good at bat from Luke Sefcik. Bearcats showcasing that offensive identity, not giving in, really doing a good job fighting with two strikes. Of late, they just have not struck out much at all. Well, I think what stands out about that series against TCU, when the Bearcats swept the Horn Frogs, they only trailed after one inning. One inning it was either tied or they had the lead. Felt like they were in complete control all weekend on both sides of the ball. Pitching really stepped up big time. Now, if we were in pro ball, Sauceville would have been out of moves about four moves ago, keeping very close tabs on Hegeman. Still nobody out. Hegeman got drilled to begin the inning. And Sauceville's been at the plate for what feels like forever. It's gonna stay up there. You see the Bearcats have the stickers on their helmets. I would assume if it is what it used to be, it's probably for quality of bats. RBIs, moving a runner, things like that. And this is certainly a quality of bat. As you said, it feels like Lou Sefcik has been dug into this batter's box for about 10 minutes at this point. Continues to fight, foul off pitches. And he sends out towards left center. Christensen moves over to make the, no, he drops it. He dropped the baseball. Had it all lined up and just never squeezed it. And it goes as a two-base knock for Sefcik. Wins the battle, but a ball that needs to be caught in left center. Credit to Luke Sefcik continuing to battle and battle and battle. You put the ball in play. If you strike out, you don't give yourself an opportunity for something like that to happen. Uh, Billy O'Connor is out of the dugout, and he wants to have a word with the third base umpire. They have scored it an error. So it's an error on the left fielder, Hayden Christensen. Just never caught it. You have to wonder, with the lights now being on, overcast guy, if it was right in that line. That's the only thing that I can think of, but he was in the right spot, had it lined up the whole way, just never made the catch. We're at that in-between. It's starting to get a little dark. It's gray. It's dim. It's got to be that. Just blended in, took his eye off it at the last second. So now Hunter Jesse batting with nobody out and two on. Popped up off of third. Hammond gives it a look again, but no play. I'll tell you, Luke Hammond's been quite active today. For he's a been decent fantastic. amount of lefties in this Bearcats lineup, he's had a lot of opportunities. Been playing in to protect against the bunt. It's such a big part of this Bearcats offensive identity, and as a result, has had some hot shots as he's playing in front of the bag over at third. The 2-1. 
Dalton Pearson is on deck. Jesse lined out on that leaping grab at short in the first inning. And he walks here in the fourth. So the base is loaded up against Sauceville. This feels like more of the same from that TCU series. Opposing pitching, some really good stuff, making good swing and miss pitches. But the Bearcats just are not chasing anything out of the zone. Doug Willey is out, the pitching coach for Xavier. That was a focus for Jordan Bischel and the Bearcats. If you have a pitch in your zone, do damage. But if it's not in your zone, wait for the next one. Lower the swing rate. Lower the chase percentage. All things that Jordan Bischel identified that needed improvement when he took over this Cincinnati job from Central Michigan. We've talked about it, Anthony. Walk rates continue to raise year over year in college baseball. So it makes a lot of sense. When that's the trend, you make your offensive approach about exploiting that trend. On the ground towards short, gobbled up. Stevenson second for one, and that's the only play he'll have. A run scores for Cincinnati. Josh Hegeman coming in from third. And now a 3-0 Bearcat lead. A fielder's choice run batted in for Dalton Pearson. First run since the first inning. Landon Vitterick at the plate, runners on the corners. Snap throw to third after the bunt bid and safe over there. Hammond's tag a little late on Jesse. I beg your pardon, on Sefcik. Nice job, nice job there by the catcher to pray to quick snap throw back. Sauceville just threw a dart over to first base. That popped the mid of McCormick. We saw him trying to keep Hegeman close, and with Pearson over there, the real threat, 12 for 14 on the year stolen base-wise, no surprise that he'll be paying close attention to him over there. That better throw would have had him that time. This Bearcats team, 75 of 85 on stolen bases. Again, this offensive approach just will not stop. Does not let the defense get comfortable in the slightest. Cincinnati is eighth in the country in stolen bases. And it's led to a top three showing in the Big 12 and runs scored per game. About eight per game. Already at three today. A lot of this offensive approach, it's nothing crazy. It's just looking at trends from kind of a macro level in college baseball and exploiting them. We know that stolen base rates are better in college than in the pros just because being able to catch and throw and not throw it away. It's harder for these college players than for professional players. And that's something that has always been known about college baseball compared to professional. And same with the walk rates. They're just exploiting general trends. That's information everyone has access to. And what sort of information does Sauceville have? That he just keeps throwing over. Probably the Pearson is one heck of a base stealer. Sauceville did read the scouting report on these Bearcats hitters today. Well, at least Billy O'Connor knows he's paying attention. Not slacking off in those pitching meetings. I'm willing to bet, Zach, he's made more throws to first in this inning than he has to home, or just about. It certainly feels that way. Three and one. And that's ball four. Now the base is reloaded for the Bearcats with the top of the order coming up. A 
chance for Loudon Brooks to come through. Bases loaded up with Bearcats in a 3-0 ball game. Wouldn't necessarily be surprised if we see a squeeze here, Anthony. After that swing, it may be. Brooks half-hearted there, wasn't sure about it. 0-1. So even with Brooks at the plate the way he's been hitting, you would consider the safety squeeze. It would never surprise me with this offense. He's a really good bunner as well. Well, he sends this a long way to right, playable for Anderson, and he's got it for the second out. Tagging and scoring from third, Sefcik trots in. And a sack fly RBI for Loudon Brooks makes it a 4-0 ball game. First baseman, Tommy O'Connor. Pearson went over to third on the tag as well. And that's going to be it for Sauceville. His day is done. He goes two-thirds of an inning. The error behind him didn't help. So two runs, one earned. And he is taken out. Middle of the fourth inning here in Cincinnati, or in Mason, excuse me, the Bearcats have the 4-0 lead. For years, Prasco has been a leading pharmaceutical company in the United States. And though we were founded in 2002, our story starts in the 1940s with a small pharmacy in Shelbyville, Kentucky. Before he was known as a founding father of the generics industry, E. Thomas Arrington was a young boy sweeping the floors at Schofields. From those roots, he went on to a successful career leading multiple pharmaceutical companies to new heights. These experiences led him to create a new business with a vision of reaching the world for Christ while building a world-class healthcare company. Presco is the leader in authorized generics, brand prescription products sold under a private label, most often made at the same exact manufacturing facility. Our unlimited business strategy focuses on breaking down barriers and unlocking potential. We use a complete approach, a long-term focus, combined with deep industry experience and excellence in planning and execution. As a result, we have returned significant value to our partners. Our pharmacy customers benefit from Prasco's best-in-class supply reliability and drug products that are identical to the brand name. Prasco's authorized generics allow patients access to high quality, more affordable medications and are available at over 60,000 pharmacies across the country. Our commitment to the community and to doing things the right way, started in a small pharmacy in Kentucky, is true today and will be for generations to come. Transfer from Fordham, Nolan Hughes is into the game. Last appeared against Bowling Green a couple of weeks ago. Two innings, struck out two in scoreless work for the Xavier Musketeers. And he comes in to replace Zossville. Now Nolan Hughes inherits first and third with two outs in the fourth inning. Two runs already in. Only one of them earned. Pitch to O'Connor is up and away. 95 on that fastball from Hughes. He's pumping it in there. No surprise there, 14 and a third innings, 26 punch outs. I expected some noise or some at least some nasty stuff from Hughes based on those stats. 6-9-1 ERA for this left-hander from Halifax, Massachusetts. Started to pitch well as of late. He's not given up a run in his last three outings and four and two thirds of work. Cut down on the walks a bit. Because with those 26 punch outs in just 14 and a third, 25 walks. So that's the story of somebody with nasty stuff sometimes struggles to find the zone. Yeah, it seems like he walks him to just strike everybody out after that, put himself in a bit of a hole and then work out of it. 
Right now he can't find it, and he just tripped over himself. He reloads the bases. Uh, tumbling off the mound, trying to find that footing at Prasco Park. And the base is all juiced up for Carrington Cross, the eighth Bearcat to bat this inning. Indecisive check swing foul. So not the guy Xavier wants to see at the plate with the bases loaded. Had four runs batted in in the first meeting on February 27th. And one of the better bat to ball guys Cincinnati has. Hughes doing a nice job filling it up with off speed as he missed four straight fastballs. Good job being your own best pitching coach, going to another pitch there when you can't find the fastball. Swing and a miss. 93 got it by him. And just like we talked about, you walk a man, you strike out a man. That has been the MO for Nolan Hughes this year. And he strands the bases loaded, helps out his teammate Sauceville, and keeps it at a four nothing deficit. Will shows up, starts small, and digs in. Will builds connections where others create barriers. Will resolves to grow beyond doubt, to be more than the sum of our setbacks. Will finds a way forward because it's not just what we do, it's who we are. Your vision, our purpose. Together, we will. What is a bear cat? A Bearcat is determined, resilient, curious. We show up ready to work, to play, to grow. And while a lot's changed in our 200 years, there is one defining trait that unites us all. Bearcats go big. Big discoveries, big dreams, big impact, big leaps for mankind, big miracles. And when we reach the summit, we fix our gaze on new heights. We never stop. That's just who we are. Bearcats go big. 3-4-5 coming up against Carson Marsh. Cincinnati's offense just helped the freshman get a little bit more breathing room. 4-0 now, bottom of the fourth. Marsh has faced the minimum through two innings. And Cincinnati pitching in general has retired the last seven. McCormick to lead it off. Lined out to right in his first at bat. Now Marsh has been very good, really all season, but especially tonight. Six up, six down for the freshman. Pitched with a ton of confidence. Bouncing ball right back to him. Comes off the mound and retires McCormick. It's now seven in a row out of the pen for Marsh. Eight in a row overall back to the end of the first inning. As we talked about for Marsh, his last appearance not his best. Allowed three runs against Baylor. Cincinnati dropped two of the three games in that series a couple of weekends ago. Bounced back against TCU this past weekend, but Marsh working to reestablish himself out of this pen and doing well tonight. Popped up off of first base. Tommy O'Connor runs it down, but out of play. He's been one of those go-to guys for Jordan Bischel out of the pen. Christian Mitchell, Brandon Garula, Ryan Insko, and Carson Marsh, all 10 plus appearances on the season. Marsh, 23 innings coming into this game. They've really rode these three, four top relievers, pitching them multiple times in a weekend, plus midweeks. A lot of volume early on in the year. One and two on Christensen, and you know that he wants to make up for the drop in left field last inning. A couple of hefty swings here. 
10 game on base streak. Now 11 after the walk in the first inning. That drop did come around to score, so that was the unearned run for Cincinnati's offense. On the ground and stopped over there by Sefcik, and a nice play on the spin. What a play by Luke Sefcik. Slides, turns around, has the wherewithal to come up and deliver a strike over to Tommy O'Connor at first base. Smooth play for a guy that's been basically the backup second baseman this year, but he just continued to earn more playing time, and he looks great over there to start. Again, we talked about it, but cannot take Brooks out of the lineup the way that he's been swinging, so Brooks starting it short today, and Sefcik playing second, getting them both in there. Two down after the good play, and a cut and miss for Dupre. We talked about it, Anthony. Jordan Bischel's got a problem, and it's a good one to have. He's got too many guys who can swing it to get in the lineup at one time. Christian Mitchell hitting 280, having a really good offensive year, not in the lineup tonight. It's a good problem to have. Biggest thing for Mitchell is the defense. He's been pitching well, he's been hitting well, but playing such a premier spot. Few too many errors. Brooks hasn't gotten an opportunity out there at shortstop yet tonight, so curious to see how he looks over there as he's been primarily a second baseman his college career. Marsh makes quick works of Xavier in the fourth inning. Punches out Dupre to end the fourth. And still 4-0 Cincinnati. Hey, so when it comes to prescription drugs, why don't you have a choice? Yeah, sure, you've got brand name drugs, but those can get expensive. And then there's regular generics, which are safe and effective, but may not be exactly the same as brand name. Why don't you have another option? Meet Authorized Generics, a unique class of generic drugs approved by the FDA, identical to the brand name, and made of the same active and inactive ingredients as the brand name. Unlike regular generics, which are manufactured by a different company and often have different inactive ingredients, which could result in a different experience. Authorized generics are identical to brand name drugs because they're made with the same exact formula, most often made in the same exact manufacturing facility to give you the same exact texture, taste, size, smell, and feel as the brand name drugs. It's all legit and always FDA approved. Look, when it comes to what you take, you deserve a choice. And you have one. Ask your pharmacist if there's an authorized generic version of your prescription today. Identical to brand name, affordable to you. AuthorizedGenerics.com. Back here at Prasco Park in Mason, Ohio. Each December, Prasco Park hosts an outdoor Christmas experience for the community with a live nativity, inflatables, food vendors, hot chocolate and cookies, crafts and more. There's sure to be something for the whole family to enjoy. Come out to Prasco Park on December 17th for your new favorite activity of the Christmas season. Mark your calendar, Zach. You take your girlfriend on a nice, lovely winter stroll. December 17th, that's actually her birthday, so that's already got a double red marker around it. I mean, you're so coming to you Prasco go. Park for the Christmas at Prasco. Hey, if they got free Skyline like they did tonight, I'll, I'll be there whether or not Emily's there or not. <laughs> Listen, honey, sweetheart, I'm busy. They got free Skyline at Prasco. Listen, I know we usually go to a nice dinner. <laughs> That's going to have to be delayed this year. They got pretty good concession stand burgers and usually free Skyline, so I'll drive. I mean, <laughs> it, it says cookies, hot chocolate, and food vendors. That sounds like Skyline to me. So take that for what it's worth, but December 17th, bring your kids, bring your husband, bring your wife, bring whoever. Just bring somebody. One and two on Josh Cross. 96 on that fastball from Hughes. Showing some electric stuff so far tonight. Hughes got the final out of last inning. Cincinnati scored two more. 
up the middle and a base hit. Second of the day for Cross. One from each side of the plate. He continues to impress. Not only with the power, but the contact as well, the on-base percentage. Looking like a really complete hitter. And there were doubts coming from the Mac whether or not after such a strong campaign last year if this would translate. But so far, UC's played a tough schedule. They're well into their Big 12 play, and he's looked fantastic. Ball one up and into Hegeman. Now for Cross, he was the freshman of the year in the MAC last season, all-conference first-team selection at Eastern Michigan. I mean, you put up numbers like that, they'll, they'll play. But it's how well it's played, how well it's translated. I don't think anybody expected a guy like Cross to be top 10 in the country and runs batted in. When you lose a guy like Ryan Nicholson, you touched on, on earlier, transferred to UK, you figured that it was going to be a, some tough shoes to fill over at first base, but Josh Cross provided a ton of value. He's done a nice job step into that role. Not to mention he's done a good job behind the dish as well, splitting time with Alec Jones. That wasn't something that I had on my radar a ton. I figured he'd be mostly at first base, but it's been big time to be able to flip him and Tommy O'Connor over there. Hughes fires and throws it down and away. Ball four. Hegeman walks. So more of that M.O. for Nolan Hughes. Big time walk, big time strikeout for the lefty. Josh Hegeman continues to get on base at a rapid clip already tonight. A base hit, hit by pitch, and now walk. Getting on base any way that he can. Showing bunt and popped up. Sefcik knew it right away. He's mad at himself. Nothing in one. 95 again from the lefty. So now they're trying that bunt that you were talking about earlier, Zach, playing more of that small ball. It's worked well for them this year. Puts a ton of pressure on the defense. Just play the percentages. Jesse is on deck. You wouldn't think that that would be the most favorable matchup, lefty on lefty, but Cincinnati's going to try it, see if they can get the runners into scoring position. Now Sefcik takes. Jesse overall has been one of their hottest hitters as they've moved into Big 12 play. Off to a slow start at the plate, but Big 12 play hitting around 400. Called strike three. Second strikeout for Nolan Hughes, and a big one in the fifth. Off-speed pitch towards the top of the zone. Sefcik didn't agree, but looked to me like that clipped the upper third of the zone. It's a big time strikeout for Hughes. One out, two men on for Jesse. And that's one thing there, Zach, maybe you can shed some light on. I don't quite understand. You square to bunt, you pop it up, then you square again, and then you square and you pull it back, you take strike two. It just seemed like they were giving away strikes there. And I know the original intent was to try to get the men over, and that didn't work. But then it just felt like they were toying, and you start getting a little too cute with it. That's the way it felt to me. You're definitely right, especially against a guy like this who's – struggle to find the zone. Sometimes when a pitcher sees a guy square, it might have the opposite effect that the, that the hitter wants. The hitter might be squaring to try to distract the pitcher. Sometimes a pitcher who's losing the zone sees a square and goes, okay, I'm just going to groove this one. It almost gives that pitcher a target. Hey, he's putting the bat in there. Let me throw to the target. Exactly. Although, as we saw in game one against Wright State in Miami, Dylan Baker tried to bunt and almost took one up and into the face. Fortunately, he was okay. That had the 
reverse effect, missing the target. Two and two. Good curveball there down in the count. The Bearcats hunting fastball. Drops in a good one there. Get back in the count. And he got him. Back-to-back -back strikeouts from Hughes. We talked before, Hughes, the high walks, high strikeouts, created some trouble for himself, walking Hegeman after a base hit to Josh Cross, but doing what he does, showcasing some really good stuff, both that 93-96 fastball and that good off-speed there. Single walk, strikeout, strikeout. And up and away to Pearson. Hughes just has the look of a guy, Zach, and the stuff of a guy that's going to draw attention from the major league level, at least from the scouts. Big time. The way he's built, the way he throws. And you see it more and more. You'll take stuff and work with it compared to Maybe better numbers and pinpoint command, but 84 to 87. Absolutely. Six foot five lefty, mid 90s. What's not to like? That one at 96. That's humming in there. Although I'm curious to see where the game of baseball goes in the next 10 years. And I say that because of all the injuries that have been riddling Major League Baseball. And the more you hear from doctors and orthopedic surgeons, that arm ligament, the one that draws most of the attention, the UCL, hits, uh, hits peak maturity at 26. I could talk about this all night, Anthony. I, uh, it's such a complex problem because obviously you say chasing velocity, more stress on the UCL, you're going to have more Tommy John, but we also know that there is a direct correlation, you can't argue it, that if you throw harder, you're going to be more successful. So you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. It's not like guys are going to stop trying to throw as hard as they can, but also there's that glaring fact that <laughs> chances are, if, if you're a high-level baseball player, you're probably going to have Tommy John surgery at some point. And that's why I'm said I'm curious to see where this game goes in 10 years because do you see less of a focus on spin rate and velo and let guys naturally develop? You'll live more with that 88 to 90. That's up and in. Oh, base is loaded now for Cincinnati. To be honest, I don't think you can put the toothpaste back in the tube, so to speak. I, I think once we have the analytics and, and you know that these metrics and the velocity is – going to get you out. I, I think people are going to continue to do it. A base is loaded for Landon Vitterick, the sophomore coming up for Cincinnati in a big spot. Two outs in this fifth. And let's be clear, you know, wishing Nolan Hughes nothing but good health and hoping that he has great health going forward. It, it's just the first thing I thought of when you see 95, 96 and a guy that projects like that and all the talk that's surrounding Major League Baseball right now, especially for a guy that is still in college. Chopped up the line and foul. Yeah, there have been guys in high school who are mid-80s getting Tommy John. I just think that it's uh, something that is, is hard to avoid. I think throwing a baseball is a very unnatural motion and there's a lot of other factors that play in. They, You've seen all these things from the MLBPA with the pitch clock and the different changes with allowing them to use any sort of, uh, you know, substance to get a better grip on the ball. A lot plays into it. I think the biggest difference is if you're seeking velo, if you're seeking spin rate, that's when you're starting to put yourself in a bad situation. If you're, you know, in Hughes's case, you're if you're naturally 6'5", 235, and you have a little extra oomph, sure, use it. But don't start gripping the heck out of the baseball and throwing 120 miles an hour or at 120% just to get that extra few miles an hour. It's definitely a tough trade-off. 
because you see the success that Velocity brings you, but you also know that there's a risk involved. Pulled on the ground towards second and scooped up by Cushing. Nice job by Nolan Hughes. Loads the bases, couple of walks mixed in, but works out of it, strikes out two, and does not allow a run, top of the fifth inning. Prasco Park is the home of the Rock the Park Concert Series, where music lovers emerge on Prasco Park to enjoy an outdoor worship experience unlike any other. With over 10 million albums sold, seven Grammys, and six number one hit singles on the Billboard's Christian Songs chart, including Made to Love, Gone, and Lose My Soul, Prasco is thrilled to announce this year's headlining artist will be Toby Mack. Join Prasco Park on September 7th for an incredible evening of worship, fellowship, and fun for the whole family. Visit prascopark.com slash rocktheparc for more information. Listen to Toby Mac and get yourself a Toby snack. As there's always plenty of food at Prasco Park. You know, if you're looking for a day job, they, they might need somebody to write these PA reads. <laughs> I could write some copy. Bottom of the fifth inning in Mason, Ohio. Anthony Mazzini, Zach Siegel with you. Bearcats up four to nothing. First pitch hacking for Cushing. We didn't have a chance to talk very much about in his first at bat. Carson Marsh made very quick work of him, but this guy's been scorching, to say the least. You mentioned it in the aftermath, Zach, but at least two hits in every game against UConn over the weekend. Has a 10-game hitting streak. Fifth-year guy was always a really tough hitter to face in my time at Cincinnati, pitching against him every year. He's been around. He's taken some great at bats, played some good competition. Big anchor in this lineup. Had a good game against Cincinnati in February. He must have been glad to see Zach Siegel no longer on the mound. Two for four with a home run, three batted in on February 27th. I should have looked to see how some of these fifth years did against me in my career. Oh, what, made, what made Cushing such a tough out when you pitched against him? He just seemed so consistent. Just wasn't going wasn't gonna to chase, wasn't going to strike out a ton. And he's gotten better year over year. Now a fifth year, it seems like he's really found a swing as we see him strike out. And yeah, Marsh strikes him out. That is back-to-back -back Ks for the freshman. And three overall, or four overall, excuse me. Marsh is absolutely lights out. Three and a third. That's 10 up, 10 down for the freshman. First pitch a little bit down and away to Hendrickson. Hendrickson popped out towards Sefcik at second, his first at bat. Hendrickson, another one of those returners, a junior now. That's one thing that really stands out about the Xavier team is they return, a lot of retention. For Billy O'Connor in this group, of course you lose some guys to graduation, but 
the most part, they return a lot of key guys, especially in the day and age of the transfer portal. Certainly helps, especially when you've got all these veterans that can help along some of the younger players. We've seen some guys on the roster last year who didn't play a ton take big steps forward this year, Connor Mish being one. Hammond, another, didn't play last year, big part of this lineup this year. Even a guy like Tyler DiMartino, who hasn't played a lot this year, just nine starts, but very, very good with the stick. Not in there today. That's bounced up the middle behind second base, and Sefcik leaves it behind. Xavier with just one hit entering this inning. We'll find out how that one gets scored in just a moment. They're going to give him the hit. Sefcik got a glove on it, just couldn't make the play behind the second base back. Hard hit ball, did a nice job staying on that fastball. Would have been a tough play for Sefcik, but started to look towards the throw before he secured the ball. Strike one on Anderson. That is the first base runner to reach against Carson Marsh in the first hit since the first inning. Time called at the plate. Anderson needed a moment with his equipment. Marsh has gone three and a third. That ties his season and career high on length of game. He's gone three and a third two other times, including great performance on March 13th, Western Illinois, three and a third, six punch outs. So if he finishes this inning, this will be his longest outing of his career. It's been a good one. This is the seventh time this year he's gone more than two innings. Anderson down one and two. And the one two. Backhanded by Cross, it squirts away and into second. On the dirt ball, Reed Hendrickson with a good jump. Now you talked about Josh Cross defensively earlier. Those are some of the plays that he's going to have to work on. Frames that one well, and that is strike three. Anderson punches out. Another big time pitch from Carson Marsh. He has made such an impact as a freshman on this Bearcat staff. Anybody in Cincinnati baseball circles might say that's no surprise as he was one of the leaders of Moeller's fantastic team last year. Had a zero ERA his senior season against some pretty good competition. Strike on Stevenson. Yeah, however you slice that. <laughs> I mean, is an era a zero ERA? It's pretty good. I mean, you would think somebody would just bound to get one off you. Especially the competition Moeller plays. Popped up, Marsh sees it, but also sees he has no play. Cross couldn't find it. At Moeller High School, one of the more renowned institutions in the area for high school athletics, really. You know, college in, or high school in general, very good academically. Outside corner for strike three. Dropped in that slider and Marsh strikes out the side in the fifth. Works around a one out hit and Marsh continues to deal. A lot of zeros on the board for Xavier through five innings.
Cincinnati has held Xavier off the board through the first five innings. Nightcap of the Joe Nuxhall Classic. Miami victorious earlier today by a score of 22 to 21. And Cincinnati leading four nothing in game two. Nolan Hughes staying on the mound for another inning. The question today, Anthony, you see coming off a huge weekend sweep of Texas Christian University, it was going to be whether or not they could continue that momentum or if they were going to have a falter in what seemed like a breakout point in their season. And so far, it's been more of the same. Great pitching, some really nice hitting as well against a good Xavier team, as I said earlier, despite the 15 and 16 record, number 33 in the RPI rankings. It's a good baseball team. A few good baseball teams here in this Joe Nuxhall Classic. Wright State, despite the loss today, came in top 25 in the nation in a lot of offensive categories. Miami had, I think some would say, been exceeding expectations in the MAC under a first year head coach. Say the same thing with Cincinnati and Jordan Bischel. Tied for second in the Big 12. This might be one of the strongest crops of talent I've seen in, in a Nuxall in recent years. On the check swing, Brooks does go around. So one and one. Yeah, the last couple of years, Miami had been scuffling a little bit. Xavier obviously went to the regional last year. They won the last two Nux Halls. But Cincinnati hadn't been very good. Wright State, it seems, every year is always right there in contention. They've gone to three consecutive regionals. They've had draft picks galore, too. Jordan Remmer, Tyler Black. They're pumping them out at Wright State. Yeah, for a long time, they've had that identity of Hitting a lot of home runs. And they've just continued with Eric Sogard's staff to be a very, very good ball club. And they're not just getting guys drafted in the 15th round. I mean, Remmer and Black were, I think, both top five round picks. Black, I think, was in the, the comp round yeah. in, between the first and second round, I want to say. He, yeah. He's been tearing it up in the minor leagues. I, I, I trained with him in the offseason. Great dude. And that misses up ball four. So a walk to begin the inning for Brooks. His first time on base today. First base Tommy O'Connor. Hughes' fourth walk. And we'll see if his stats will kind of continue to play into themselves. We'll see if he gets a big punch out here. That's what we've seen so far. Walk, strikeout, walk, strikeout. Been able to limit the damage. It's exactly what we expected. Good grab from McCormick over there. Your numbers only tell so much of the story, but they're a pretty good indication. And when you have huge strikeout numbers, but huge walk numbers, they almost cancel each other out. There's a big fastball, 93, right by Tommy O'Connor. Power versus power here. Big lefty on big lefty. Nine home runs for Tommy O'Connor. Had a home run against TCU. That was his only hit of the TCU series. Had five home runs over his last three series, however. Two against Baylor, two against St. Louis. Coach Jordan Bischel shouting to the field umpire looking for a balk call on that one. Just missed.
Called strike three. A little bit of a delayed call there, but O'Connor gets rung up nonetheless. And one gone in the sixth inning. Good slider there, probably about a ball off. It's a nice pitcher's pitch. You're going to get that call a lot of the time. And that'll be it for Nolan Hughes. Really good outing from the big lefty. Ends up going... Inning and a third. An inning and two thirds, I beg your pardon. And his day is done after the strikeout to O'Connor. Call to the bullpen. Xavier bringing in a fresh arm here in the sixth. For years, Presco has been a leading pharmaceutical company in the United States. And though we were founded in 2002, our story starts in the 1940s with a small pharmacy in Shelbyville, Kentucky. Before he was known as a founding father of the generics industry, E. Thomas Arrington was a young boy sweeping the floors at Schofields. From those roots, he went on to a successful career leading multiple pharmaceutical companies to new heights. These experiences led him to create a new business with a vision of reaching the world for Christ while building a world-class healthcare company. Presco is the leader in authorized generics, brand prescription products sold under a private label, most often made at the same exact manufacturing facility. Our unlimited business strategy focuses on breaking down barriers and unlocking potential. We use a complete approach, a long-term focus, combined with deep industry experience and excellence in planning and execution. As a result, we have returned significant value to our partners. Our pharmacy customers benefit from Prasco's best-in-class supply reliability and drug products that are identical to the brand name. Prasco's authorized generics allow patients access to high-quality, more affordable medications and are available at over 60,000 pharmacies across the country. Our commitment to the community and to doing things the right way, started in a small pharmacy in Kentucky, is true today and will be for generations to come. Now Billy O'Connor going to one of his trusted arms here in the sixth inning. Jonathan Kelly, fifth all-time in Xavier's program history in appearances, 86 of them this right-hander from West Lynn, Oregon. Three, two, four ERA, his 13th appearance. He has saved three games. So he's in to try to keep this at a four nothing Cincinnati lead. 86 appearances in these five years at Xavier, including the COVID short in 2020. Only five starts, 142 innings, so. This has been a trusted bullpen arm for years here for the Musketeers. And another guy that has stuck around. Came back to the program. He faces Carrington Cross, first man to face Kelly. Pitch up and away, it's a pitch out and a dead duck at second. Cincinnati was trying something there and Xavier had it read like a book. Loudon Brooks is out number two. Musketeers understand that the stolen base is a huge part of the Bearcats' offensive identity, so they were guessing there that Brooks would test Kelly coming into the game, and they guessed correctly, as you said. Well, you had cross bunting as well here. He was showing bunt, so... I don't know if Cincinnati was trying some sort of a hit and bunt, or I don't really know, but regardless, Xavier had it read, they had it scouted, and... I think that's yeah. something you see a lot, the show bunt slash stolen base. And Xavier's played the Bearcats enough to know that. They had it read like a book. Oh, caught stealing for out number two. That officially closes the book on Hughes. 
So he went an inning in two thirds, allowed just one hit, walked four, but struck out four. So again, those walks and strikeouts pretty much erase one another. Did not allow a run. Two two offering. And it's fly down the right field line, twisting towards the corner. Anderson makes the catch on the wall. Cross gives it a ride, nothing to show for it. And he is out number three. Good job between Hughes and Kelly to navigate that sixth inning. Joe Nuxall Miracle League Fields, a place where every individual with every challenge gets every chance to play the game of baseball. Help us keep the legacy of the old left-hander going strong. To learn more or to support our mission, visit NuxallMiracleLeague.org or find us on Facebook. Well, Zach, you thought that Cincinnati may have gone one more with Carson Marsh, but instead they turn it over to Chase Horst. So the lefty is into the game here. Marsh was great. Four innings, struck out six, did not allow a hit nor a run. And Horst comes in his sixth appearance of the year with a 6.75 ERA. Chase Horst, a big role last year for the Bearcats as a freshman. Missed some time due to injury earlier in the season, about a month between late February to late March. He's had a couple of appearances since returning against St. Louis on March 24th and Louisville on March 26th, most recently where had a rough outing, two-thirds of an inning, three runs. So has not quite found his form yet this season for the Bearcats, but a guy that they're going to count on down the stretch. He did pitch against Xavier in that game on February the 27th. Three innings, two runs in a start before going down with that injury. This is a guy they're expecting big things from. 48 and two-thirds innings as a freshman, 47 strikeouts and a sub-five ERA in between some starts and some bullpen appearances. Really talented arm. And as I said, coming back from being banged up a bit, big things on his horizon this year. And he faces the top of the order for Xavier. Feels like this could be a good inning to try to chip away. Down four runs. Ball one inside to Hammond. Horst was an all-conference freshman team in the American last year. As you mentioned, pitched nearly 50 innings. Had a 4.99 ERA. Bounced around between the bullpen and the rotation. He comes at you kind of crossfire, little low three quarters lefty. Really interesting pitch makeup. Check swing, called the strike anyway. And the count is even at two and two on Luke Hammond. One for two day for the leadoff man. Late swing, fouled off. And the 2-2 got him. Foul tip held by Cross for strike three. Good fastball from Horst. He slowed him down on the big 73 mile an hour sweeping slider and then sped him up with a 89 mile an hour fastball up in the zone. First pitch swinging, Mish out to second. And Sefcik takes care of that. 
And that right there is exactly what you're going to see a lot of from Chase Horst. Right-handed hitter. He's got that good sinking fastball. You're going to see a ton of work out there for the second baseman. Just pounding it into the ground when he's on, when he's got that sinker working. Two up and two down. By the way, that strikeout for Hammond was the ninth for Cincinnati pitching through five and two-thirds innings. Rain has started to fall just lightly in Cincinnati as McCormick digs in and rolls it over to the right side into the shift. And Sefcik, bang, bang, play, gets it in time for the final out of the sixth inning. So Cincinnati takes a 4-0 lead on to the seventh here at Prasco Park in Mason. Top of the seventh inning at Prasco Park in Mason. Second leg of the Joe Nuxhall Classic. Cincinnati leads it 4-0. Trying for another win. They swept TCU over the weekend. After falling two out of three against Baylor the weekend prior. Josh Cross to lead it off. 4-5-6 for Cincinnati. Top of the seventh inning. Bearcats team, Zach, just continues to exceed a lot of expectations. First year head coach, first year in a superior conference, the Big 12 compared to the American. And this one far from over yet, still three at bats for Xavier here, but Cincinnati's hit quite the little groove and in search of a 20th win tonight. This Bearcats team plays hard. It seems like they've really bought into the offensive approach and just the team identity in general. One of the loudest dugouts I have ever heard. Just constantly up on the rail, yelling, cheering for their guys, even doing some different chants and team things. Just energy. That's the third hit of the day for Josh Cross. All of them singles, but a three for four day. Josh Cross continuing to show why he is one of the most feared hitters in the Big 12. But now source for concern, Jordan Bischel running out along with the team athletic trainer to check on Cross at first base. Something not feeling right as he came off of first base. That's the last thing that Cincinnati wants to see in a midweek game really at any point of the season, but especially in a midweek. And you would have to think, if it's any question of significant injury, that Cross is not going to stay in this game. Why risk it? Looks like he was kind of doing a bit of a calf raise, maybe a bit of a calf cramp as we see now. He's putting his toe up in the air as if to stretch it. You hope it's just a calf cramp or something minor. Well, he did enough to talk himself in. Talk himself into staying in. 
We'll see how he runs if Hegeman can get the ball in play. Pitch from Kelly, misses down and in. Kelly's a guy that is just your prototypical fifth year reliever. He's gonna change arm slots. We've seen a kind of sidearm slot. We've seen over the top, mixing speeds as there's that sidearm fastball at 85, 86, and then the overhand fastball more 87 to 90. Just does a really good job mixing looks, messing with his timing, doing everything that you expect out of a veteran pitcher. Yeah, at this point, there's probably not much that Jonathan Kelly has not seen or not tried. Fifth year reliever, a real journeyman of college baseball between regular season and summer ball. This guy's seen a lot of innings. Talk about that deception, Zach. He hides the ball to begin with, tucks that leg and kind of crouches in, holds it up near his knee. Doesn't show it until late. Everything runs away there from Hegeman, ball four. And just looking at Cross go down to second, he's still kind of gimpy. He doesn't look to be at full strength. I'm still a little bit surprised to see him stay in that game. You're right, it looks to be trying to kind of shake out that, that left leg, that calf. Showing bunt and call the strike. Zefsik has had trouble getting it down tonight. I think the biggest thing to monitor would be next inning for Cross when he's the catcher. If it is that calf or ankle, is he going to be able to stay in there? Sefcik, good bunt, first base line. But Dupre has been up to the challenge today, coming out from behind the plate. Nice round of applause for Sefcik from the dugout. Seems a little bit of a, a mock round of applause, but a round of applause nonetheless. He did his job. Coaches and players alike giving him his props for getting the bunt down after failing to do so in the last at bat. Infield in for the Musketeers as Jesse watches it outside. Good stop by Dupre. He's been good tonight behind the dish. He's looked great, hopping out from the crouch to get to some bunts, blocking everything up, throwing out runners with pitch outs. He's looked fantastic. Kelly falling behind, 3-0. Gotten behind the majority of the batters he's faced so far this game, but ends up getting back in the count, mixing slots and flipping in off speed. Not doing himself a lot of favors, though. Do some pitchers actually thrive doing that, kind of forcing themselves to throw strikes, falling behind? It certainly seems like anecdotally, but I'm sure if you check the stats, it would probably say that most pitchers are much worse behind in the count. But to your point, it seems like there's some guys who Love getting behind and working their way back. Because there's a trademarked hard 90 from Hunter Jesse, this Bearcats team that loves to do that. They get hit and they still sprint. Now base is loaded for Dalton Pearson. That's been a part of Jordan Bischel's teams for a long time. I remember Central Michigan team made that postseason run. I want to say 2019, they were doing that bringing some of those traditions from him with the Chippewa days. 
Kelly just struggling to find it. Been behind and every count is a Denny. One and one on Pearson. This is a guy, however, Anthony, who is no stranger to a double play when he drops down that arm slot. Veteran guy, you know he's just looking to get a sinker down and in and get a double play here. Pearson would be a tough guy to double up. We've talked about it down in the eight nine spot. He's kind of acting as a second leadoff hitter for the Bearcats. He's looked really good since being moved down in the order, taking the pressure off. I have a feeling that a strikeout is at the top of Kelly's mind here. Two and two. A lot to think about when you're a hitter, when you got multiple arm slots in his repertoire. Flight out to center. A couple steps back for Hendrickson. It'll be plenty deep enough. And tagging, here comes Cross. And he'll get there. Cincinnati adds another run on the sack fly for Dalton Pearson. Second time tonight that Pearson has brought in a run without a hit. Just doing his job. And the day will be done for Kelly. Uh, just never really had good command tonight. He gives up a run here in the seventh inning. And another call to the bullpen. The fifth pitcher about to be used by Xavier in the top of the seventh inning. For years, Presco has been a leading pharmaceutical company in the United States. And though we were founded in 2002, our story starts in the 1940s with a small pharmacy in Shelbyville, Kentucky. Before he was known as a founding father of the generics industry, E. Thomas Arrington was a young boy sweeping the floors at Schofields. From those roots, he went on to a successful career leading multiple pharmaceutical companies to new heights. These experiences led him to create a new business with a vision of reaching the world for Christ while building a world-class healthcare company. Presco is the leader in authorized generics, brand prescription products sold under a private label, most often made at the same exact manufacturing facility. Our unlimited business strategy focuses on breaking down barriers and unlocking potential. We use a complete approach, a long-term focus, combined with deep industry experience and excellence in planning and execution. As a result, we have returned significant value to our partners. Our pharmacy customers benefit from Prasco's best-in-class supply reliability and drug products that are identical to the brand name. Prasco's authorized generics allow patients access to high-quality, more affordable medications and are available at over 60,000 pharmacies across the country. Our commitment to the community and to doing things the right way started in a small pharmacy in Kentucky is true today and will be for generations to come. Alex Vera is the new pitcher, another high-end arm for the Xavier team. Picked up the save on Friday against UConn. He had a save against Cincinnati earlier this year as well. One and two-thirds inning scoreless. Overall, the numbers aren't great. 8-2-4 ERA, but this guy's been clicking over the last couple of outings. They've been using him a ton out of the bullpen. 18 appearances, 19.2 innings. He's been a two outings a weekend guy all season for the, Bear, or for the Musketeers. And then mixing in a midweek. Certainly getting a lot of chances this year. Spent four years with the Illini at Illinois. Pitched a lot with Illinois as well. Say that three times fast. Illinois Illini. Illinois Illini. 
He's closing in on a new career high in appearances in a season. That was 20 last year. Tonight's his 19th. With still all but one series of Big East play to go. Safe to say he will nearly double that number at the rate he's pitching. Quickly nothing and two on Landon Vitterick. Back pick to second and a bang bang play almost got him. Nice move. Vera's different than some of these guys we talked about with the high walk numbers. His trouble's been getting hit around. In 19.2 innings, 32 hits, just six walks. So he's a guy that's typically in the zone. No surprise he's been trusted a lot by the Xavier coaching staff. The guys that throw it over the plate tend to get a lot of opportunities as there's nothing coaches hate more than seeing their guys walk the yard. Well, let me tell you about a game earlier today. Runner taken off for third. Vera spins off the mound. And a throw to second, and the ball is dropped. It rotates into center. Josh Hageman just wreaking havoc. And Xavier could not get him out. Vera had a perfect opportunity with that spin. Just couldn't get him on the tag. Again, the Bearcats just continue. Put pressure on the defense and force them to execute and make a play. As we see, it's harder than it looks. Musketeers, good chance to get Hegman out on the pickoff. One and two on Vitterick. Hegeman somehow still at second. And they continue to try. Not only, Anthony, have they used him a lot, They've used him way more than any other pitcher. His 19th appearance, nobody else has more than 13 with Kelly and Bailey, so he has really been counted on. Nineteen appearances, 31 games. He's out there much more than he's not. <laughs> which is surprising because the opponent batting average against him is north of 350. Definitely an interesting case. Five seconds to throw. And time and a throw. Now the time is because there is a big inflatable in right field. And now popped by Aiden Anderson. That wasn't a very friendly thing to do. Rained on some kids' parade. Popped their bubble, some would say. Maybe if Xavier was on the other end of a shutout, it would have been a little nicer to the inflatable on the field, but. Not when you're down 5 0. The way this game's going. That's going to be more frustrating. Payoff pitch, runners take off, and it's ball four. So Vera walks his first man, and right as you talked about, Zach, not walking many guys. I think most of that walk goes to Hegeman's credit. It's a great at-bat by Josh Hegeman. We've sung his praises tonight already. Four bats, he's been on base four times. What's not to love? So now back to the top of the order for Loudon Brooks. Excuse us, Fitterick. Well, I meant with Hegeman causing havoc at second base, taking the attention away from the batter. Oh, absolutely. Fitterick, another one, though. Yes. As the, the, the batting average doesn't jump out at you, but the on-base percentage is well over 400. So another guy that worked two walks today. Very similar stances. Easy to get them confused, but... I think we were talking about two different things there. <laughs> Wouldn't be the first time. We're often on page about food. That's, That's right. one thing we can't collaborate on. Both some positives for the Bearcats and hitters that have done a nice job on the offensive side of the ball. Brooks is the seventh Bearcat to hit this inning.
Rivera dropping down there, similar to Kelly, mixing up the looks. Wonder if that's something that is implemented here by Coach Wiley. Brooks down one and two. And he'll go down swinging. Strikeout for Vera to end the seventh inning. And it's time to stretch at Prasco. Bearcats tack on another run, lead at five nothing. Will shows up, starts small and digs in. Will builds connections where others create barriers. Will resolves to grow beyond doubt, to be more than the sum of our setbacks. Will finds a way forward because it's not just what we do, it's who we are. Your vision, our purpose. Together, we will. What is a Bearcat? A Bearcat is determined, resilient, curious. We show up ready to work, to play, to grow. And while a lot's changed in our 200 years, there is one defining trait that unites us all. Bearcats go big. Big discoveries, big dreams, big impact, big leaps for mankind, big miracles. And when we reach the summit, we fix our gaze on new heights. We never stop. That's just who we are. Bearcats go big. The rain continues to fall here at Prasco Park in Mason. Not heavy, but certainly a good mist. This is why the game was originally moved up and then started an hour and a half late. Never works out the way it's intended, does it, Zach? Never once. Wright State and Miami had other plans, decided to play a four plus hour long game. 22 runs for Miami on 21 hits. 21 runs for Wright State on 23 hits. The game lasted four hours and 28 minutes. <laughs> so much for that pitch clock. First pitch swinging and a ground ball through the left side. Base hit to start off the bottom of the seventh inning. Aiden Christensen is aboard. That ball was crushed. I don't have Trackman exit velo numbers, but the eye test has that one at over 100. Does a good job jumping all over the fastball, trying to get something going for these Xavier Musketeers who have been quieted by the Bearcats pitching so far today. Yeah, that's just their third hit. One for Hammond. Now a square and a bunt and a foul tip by Dupre. But Hammond, Christensen, and Hendrickson have the hits today. Not much doing. These Musketeers now have struggled to hit the last few games. Shut out 1-0 on Sunday against UConn. The game before that on Saturday was low scoring. Didn't have much offense there either. They did score nine on Friday in the series opening win. That has been it lately. On the ground, one hop to short. Picked by Brooks, there's one, and they turn it. That hit quickly eliminated on the 6-4-3 twin killing. First time Brooks has had any action over there as that was a story that we wanted to note was Brooks making his first start over at shortstop on the other side of second base from what he's used to, but did a good job, handled that hard hit ball, turned a nice double play with his middle infield mate, Luke Sefcik. So Chase Horst, who is still pitching for Cincinnati, gets the double play. Two outs in the seventh inning for Cushing. That's horse bread and butter, as I said, working with that hard sinker. He's going to get a ton of ground balls, and that's going to lend itself to some double plays. Cushing 0 for 2, strikeout and flyout today. A rare down game for him lately. The way he's been hitting it, he feels due this at bat. Weekly to second, 
Sefcik slides over, and it ends up being a 1-2-3 inning. Three up and three down. And Chase Horst has been very good out of the pen. In addition to baseball, Prasco Park hosts a variety of other events throughout the year, including a newer addition to the event lineup, the Prasco Park Motor Classic. First annual Motor Classic last year, Prasco Park had over 100 unique cars in attendance, and awards were given to Best in Show, Best Muscle Car, Best Classic Car, and more. Come out this year on October 5th to take in the atmosphere, so you can add that to your date night list, Zach. Prasco oh. Park Motor Classic, October 5th. I'll bring my Civic. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a classic Civic? Does 2011 count as classic? Yeah. Depending on how old you are. <laughs> Top of the eighth inning. Alex Vera stays on the bump for the Musketeers after finishing off the seventh. Tommy O'Connor, Carrington Cross, and perhaps Josh Cross. We shall see. Good point there. Looks like he cramped up around first in his last at bat. We'll see how that leg's feeling. Swing and a miss, and down goes O'Connor. Tripled back in the first inning, but he's been quiet since then. And a good job by Vera. So Josh Cross has come out on deck. Good to see for Cincinnati fans. But Carrington Cross first. Slow day for Cross at the plate, 0 for 4. And time called, something in right field, the ball out of the bullpen. No popping that one. That would be harder to do. Fly ball hit the other way down the right field line, and Anderson tracks it down. We talked about it earlier, fly balls to right are going to be tough today with the wind blowing out to left, a crosswind from right to left. Now cross flies out, he is 0 for 5. A rare down day for Carrington Cross. Luckily, the other cross has... Three hits to his name. So it's not all lost if you're across. Let's see what you did there. <laughs> Weekly hit back to the mound. Vera fields his position and makes it a 1 2 3 eighth inning. Can't do it much better than that for Alex Vera.
Chase Horst still pitching for Cincinnati, bottom of the eighth inning in a 5 to nothing ball game. Bearcats struck early, and they've added a little more along the way, trying for a fourth consecutive win. Horses look good, we said. Looking to bounce back from a couple tough outings a few weeks back. Still trying to work back from an injury earlier in the season, but so far tonight it's been a lot of his bread and butter. Ground balls to second base, got that big 6-4-3 double play, punch out, just one hit. Looks like he's returning to form here, Anthony. After missing time with injury, he shook some rust off his previous two outings. But in a groove tonight. That'll break up the groove. Just inside the third base bag for Hendrickson. And he's digging for two. He'll get there without a throw and a leadoff double for Carter Hendrickson, his second hit today. Nice job there, knows that Horst pitches primarily off of his fastball, not gonna go to that big slider until later in the zone typically, and all over that fastball. Again, the Xavier team really looking for something to get going, and Hendrickson doing his best to get them started. Down and in on Anderson. So is that the recipe for success against Horse? Go to that swing early to avoid that slider and later in the count? It certainly seems like it with the way he's been pitching primarily off the fastball early in counts. But you also just want to look for it up over the plate, just like with any sinker baller. When it's down in the zone, you're probably just going to play right into his trap and pound the ball into the turf, or the dirt in this case. That ball's hit a very long way. Left center field, and Xavier's going to get on the board. Aiden Anderson, a two-run shot. And like you were just talking about, Zach, catchers do not catch high sinkers. That one leaves the yard. Great swing by Anderson. That's a guy. We've seen some power from him this year. This will be his seventh home run of the year. Gets that fastball up. And that'll get the Xavier dugout back in this game. Back-to-back -back hits to open up the seventh inning, or the eighth inning, I beg your pardon. Jordan Bischel out of the dugout. Has not signaled for a move yet. But he will take the ball from Horst. Tried to get him through this eighth inning. Didn't work out. And the sophomore is done. Christian Mitchell on his way in. Trying to pick up a save here against the Musketeers in the second game of the Joe Nuxhall Classic. Hey, so when it comes to prescription drugs, why don't you have a choice? Yeah, sure, you've got brand name drugs, but those can get expensive. And then there's regular generics, which are safe and effective, but may not be exactly the same as brand name. Why don't you have another option? Meet Authorized Generics, a unique class of generic drugs approved by the FDA, identical to the brand name, and made of the same active and inactive ingredients as the brand name. Unlike regular generics, which are manufactured by a different company and often have different inactive ingredients, which could result in a different experience. Authorized generics are identical to brand name drugs because they're made with the same exact formula, most often made in the same exact manufacturing facility to give you the same exact texture, taste, size, smell, and feel as the brand name drugs. It's all legit and always FDA approved. Look, when it comes to what you take, you deserve a choice. And you have one. Ask your pharmacist if there's an authorized generic version of your prescription today. Identical to brand name, affordable to you. AuthorizedGenerics.com Bottom of the eighth inning. Two runs in for Xavier. Two run shot for Aiden Anderson. And Cincinnati turns it over to Christian Mitchell. Not overpowering stuff necessarily, Zach, but just always finds a way to get the job done. A lot of sneaky good outings for Christian Mitchell. He's had a sneaky 
great season. 1.69 ERA, 21 and a third innings pitched. Strikeout to walk, fantastic. At 15 punch outs to just three walks. So exactly what you want out of a reliever. He's going to pound the zone. He's going to be competitive every time. Not going to walk guys. And while he's gotten a lot of attention for his play at shortstop and hitting, he has made a huge impact out of this Bearcats bullpen. Been arguably their go-to high leverage guy out of the bullpen. Lined out to right, Vitterick coming in and he's got it. He's gotten some great jumps tonight. And Mitchell retires his first batter. Yeah, for Mitchell pitched on Saturday against TCU, three and a third innings. Struck out a season high four batters in a scoreless appearance. Didn't give up a hit. Five of his past seven have been scoreless. We talked about the importance of the Joe Nuxall Classic and just the competitive nature of playing Xavier. Not to mention that the Bearcats looking for at-large chances. The number 33 RPI Xavier game is going to matter. They have not gone to any of their less experienced arms. I mean, they have been pitching their guys tonight. They went Garula, who obviously has been a huge piece to their rotation this year. Then they went Marsh, one of their highest used and better relievers. And then Horst, the guy they expect a lot out of. And now to Mitchell, their high leverage arm. So not to say sometimes you, you're you always playing to win, but in, in these midweeks, a lot of times you give younger guys opportunities. But they're going with their guys tonight. Hammond takes down. And really the one guy that you could argue falls into that category is Horst. Someone they're still working to get back on track and you know, no fault of his that he got hurt. Just fell out of that rotation a little bit because of the injury. I mean, you could say the same thing about Xavier as well. They've used Kelly, they've used Vera. They started Bailey, who's been a very good arm for them, often used. That's a walk. And Hammond is aboard with one out. Well, the tying run is now on deck for the Musketeers with Connor Mish at the plate. Xavier finally getting something going here in this eighth inning. Double home run and now a walk. Of note for Cincinnati, Alec Jones is now catching. So Jones is catching, no more Josh Cross behind the plate. Flied to right towards the corner. Anderson, I beg your pardon, Vitterick going over. And that wind just continues to knock it down. Vitterick was going back towards the wall. And that came back in significantly for the second out. Wind has been a factor all day, as you said. A launching pad to left, but right field is as good as dead. So Vitterick makes the grab on the fly out to right. And now Matt McCormick showing bunt. Now Cincinnati shifts him big time on the right side, so over near third base is very vacant. Carrington Cross going to favor that way a little bit now. What impresses me about McCormick is he goes up there, he's got a good grip on the bat. He swings hard, but he swings under control. He's not one of those sluggers that is going to hit 220 with 20 home runs. He hits for a good average. Absolutely. Coming into this game, average right around 300. Some strikeouts, but also a good number of walks. Leads the team in walks as well as strikeouts. But also up there in the top of the team with at bats. I mean, that cut right there. He's going after it, but he's still hitting 300 for the most part this year. He Tough is, night tonight, 0 for 3. But. He is looking for homers, though. 10 home runs to just three doubles. So 
if he's getting an extra base hit, it's likely leaving the yard. That's a testament to how strong McCormick is. Mitchell's 2-2. Two -two. And it's grounded into the shift and botched by Carrington Cross. So Cross, who was playing over on that middle up, or up the middle, second base side of the bag, just boots one there. Out of position a little bit with the shift. And that'll continue this eighth inning. Credit to McCormick, he hit that ball hard. And as I've said tonight, when you hit the ball hard, put it in play, good things happen. Ball was crushed. So that is officially an E5. That was Cross attempting to make that play. Despite being on the second base side of the bag. And here we are, Anthony, in a game that seemed pretty comfortable for Cincinnati. We're suddenly in a huge spot, tying run at the plate in the bottom of the eighth. And the guy that dropped the fly ball earlier, Hayden Christensen, with a golden opportunity to really make up for it. It did not lead to a spiraling effect. One run did score after the drop, but good opportunity for him to get back in some good graces. Cut and a miss. Good slider from Mitchell. Mitchell does such a nice job mixing in that hard slider and that slow changeup with that fastball on both sides of the plate. Lined up the middle and caught. Sefcik perfectly placed. That retires the side in the eighth inning. Xavier with a little bit of life. They get the two-run home run for Aiden Anderson and make it a three-run game going to the ninth inning. Christian Mitchell escapes some trouble in the bottom of the eighth inning. Two runs in for Xavier to get within three. And one inning left of the Joe Nuxhall Classic. Musketeers have gone to the bullpen again. Aiden Cook is into the game. Cook on the season has struggled. Just one appearance. Two thirds of an inning allowed a run. So just his second appearance of the year. Pitched against Bowling Green a couple of weeks ago. I'm a bit surprised to see the Musketeers going with the guy with just one appearance under his belt in this situation as they've got all the, all the momentum on their side in a game that, as we talked about, Anthony, is must win. These teams have been using a lot of their high leverage arms, but again, these midweeks are a great opportunity for guys to prove themselves. And Aiden Cook in a big spot. Still down three, but as I said, all the momentum on Xavier's side with them putting up those two runs in the bottom of the eighth. Well, a good spot to bring a lefty in here with Hegeman, Sefcik, Jesse, Pearson, and Vitterick. So three of the next five are all lefties. Billy O'Connor trying to play the matchups a little bit. And rolling with the freshman from Penfield, New York. Hegeman is technically one for one. Hit by pitch and two walks. Cook's outing, both outs were strikeouts, so 
the stuff is there. Now he just has to locate it. Four pitch walk out of the pen. And Hageman's on base will just continue to go up. Fifth time tonight. Three walks, a hit by pitch, and a single. And it is a very quick hook for Aiden Cook. Not messing around. Gave the freshman a chance, and he didn't have it. So Xavier going back to the pen, down three. Joe Nuxall Miracle League Fields, a place where every individual with every challenge gets every chance to play the game of baseball. Help us keep the legacy of the old left-hander going strong. To learn more or to support our mission, visit NuxallMiracleLeague.org or find us on Facebook. So a very quick leash. Getting Aiden Cook out of there, walked his only batter on four pitches. And Jake Lambden is into the game. Lambden, who is listed as an infielder, has exclusively pitched this season. Freshman from out in California, put up some pretty good numbers this year out of the pen. He's done a really nice job through seven appearances, 11 innings pitched, 14 punch outs, holding hitters, just a 162 batting average, so with a 3-2-7 ERA has been one of the statistical leaders in that category for the Musketeers. And another big spot as he'll inherit that base runner. Last appeared against Bowling Green. Went one and two thirds with a run allowed. Struck out the side against Wright State earlier this season team that just scored 21 runs earlier today. Now Sefcik is the first to face Lambden. Hammond is way in, expecting the bunt. Pitch out again and a snap to first, Hegeman back. As the old saying goes, fool me one, shame on you. If you're Cincinnati, fool me twice, shame on me. Not trying the bunt and run. Almost had him there as we see Hegman doing that vault lead, taking a big hop off the bag. Whenever anybody says that quote, I just think of the uh, George Bush version of the quote. <laughs> That's what I think of as well. Fool me. Fool me once, can't get fooled again. And then the... Is that a J. Cole song? I was going to say, and then the famous interpolation in the J. Cole song. What do they say about fooling you three times? I went that we're not allowed to say that. Uh, he doesn't respect the peace sign. He's going to load the chopper and let it rain on you. <laughs> That's what Jermaine Cole said. I don't even know where to go off of that. Just let that one sit for a minute. Didn't know you were such a fan of his work. <laughs> that is probably his biggest song. No Role Models. It is a good one. Off of uh, 2014 Forest Hills Drive. 
You know, the last time we worked together, Zach, we were talking about the pregame playlist and how I was jamming out. And we were talking about different artists, and I don't know, you were throwing some around that I had never really heard of. <laughs> what can I say? I'm a Gen Zer. I uh, I enjoy my hip hop music. Learn something new about you. <laughs> Back to regularly scheduled programming. It's a 3-1 count on Sefcik. And it's now a walk on Sefcik. Lambden coming out of the pen and walking, guys. See how quick of a hook Billy O'Connor has this time. Not what they were looking for after that big momentum swing in the bottom of the eighth, putting up two runs off Chase Horst. This is the kind of situation that when you're a coach, just makes you want to pull your hair out. You feel like you're in a position to strike and your pitchers go out there and walk the first two batters. That is the 10th walk for Xavier pitching tonight. That's been the difference. Those walks have allowed the Bearcats to do what they do, put pressure on, move runners, a couple of sack flies. Just one game after Wright State walked 13. Miami only walked six, but 10 for Xavier tonight. Only two for the Bearcats. Billy O'Connor with a hop, skip, and a jog in and out. Getting the troops settled. Ahead of Hunter Jesse. Showed Bunt, chops it up the middle, behind the bag. No tag there, and the throw is in time. Holding the bag at first, McCormick with a nice stretch. And that is a dandy of a play by the shortstop, Stevenson. Did a nice job, that ball took him up the middle. Thought he might be able to tag the advancing runner, Sefcik, but made the good decision to just take the out there at first. But We'll have a bit of a discussion on whether or not first baseman McCormick pulled his foot or not. And Jordan Bischel wants to bring the minds together. See if anybody saw it differently. One thing I've been noticing, Zach, the managers aren't going past their respective baseline. They've been having to call over the umpire You're if right. they wanted to have any sort of discussion. I wonder if that's a Prasco Park rule or stipulation or if you're not allowed to run onto the field. Could be. I saw Billy O'Connor do it earlier and I didn't think huh. much of it, but Jordan Bischel just did the same thing. But the call stands after the meeting between today's umpiring crew. So Jesse is out at first base. Second and third for the Bearcats. Infield in for Xavier. That bounces in there. But no advance for Hegeman. Not a lot of foul territory here behind home plate. You'd like to think with Hegeman's speed, he likely scores. But Cincinnati not taking any chances with Pearson at the plate, two in scoring position with one out. Snap throw to third, kind of a lull you to sleep and just in there, Hegeman. That's a really good shoot from Dupre. He continues to look fantastic back there. The snap throw back, blocking up off speed in the dirt. He's done a nice job back there for the Muskies today. That was deceiving. Almost baited Hegeman. Generous strike, it appears. Pearson didn't like it.
2-1. That one gets away. Hegeman trying this time. Play at the plate, and Hegeman is out. I think he had a better chance at the first one. He got a late jump. He paused for a split second before going. He, he didn't go off that first read. And despite his great speed with this short backstop, you're not going to have a great chance there. So the wild pitch gets Sefcik to third, but it results in Hegeman being thrown out at the plate. And a big second out for the Musketeers defense. Down three runs in the top of the ninth inning. That's low for Pearson, the 11th walk for Xavier pitching. Oh, two on and two out for Vitterick. Two walks today for the right fielder for Cincinnati. Musketeers have had to pay a lot of attention to the base runners tonight. Between Cincinnati's prowess, stealing bases, and Xavier walking a lot of guys. Delayed steal here and a fake. Pearson jogs into second with a steal. Fiderick also not the guy you want to pitch to if you're trying not to walk somebody. With those two walks tonight, he's at 29 walks on the season, which is, I believe, tied for the lead with Carrington Cross. So although his batting average is down around 230, his on-base percentage is north of 400 because he's done such a great job working walks. That's why Jordan Bischel keeps going to him. That's where we see the value of some stats other than batting average. A la Moneyball. That OBP is everything. Now we can up a, open up a whole can of worms on that conversation. The thing that gets me is you can see that with the naked eye. You don't need OBP plus X, Y, Z to tell you that. That's true. I think OBP is still probably king. That and OPS. To an extent, I'd say OPS is a better qualifier. On base percentage means you're getting on base. That can be an error, fielder's choice, walk, hit, everything. Batting average, I think, still tells you who comes through in clutch spots. Very true. Sometimes you need a hit. Cincinnati could use one here. And they won't get it. Lambden bears down and buries that one in the bottom part of the zone. Big time pitch. Well, Viterek strikes out looking. Cincinnati, despite all that traffic, can't get a run in. And it'll stay at a three-run lead. Xavier's last chance in the bottom of the ninth coming up.
Christian Mitchell with a chance for a two-inning save tonight. He's done it at other points this year. Picked up a two-plus inning save against Oakland earlier this season. And trying to do it again against Xavier. 5-2 ball game. Called strike one on Matthew Dupre. 6-7-8 in Xavier's order. Oh, and two. We talked about the, the stuff of Mitchell, that it's not going to blow you away. The slider and the changeup aren't going to light up metric numbers, but he dots. That is a perfectly located changeup right off the first pitch fastball. There's a good slider out of the zone, a good chase pitch. He's been on his A game lately. Something you see less and less of is guys now are just, as we talked about earlier, looking for velocity and stuff. A lot of pitching coaches now will say if you're throwing something nasty, aim middle and let it work. But Mitchell subscribes to that old school philosophy where he's nipping the corners. I like Greg Maddox. Exactly. 3-2. Oh, beg your pardon, 2-2, two, two, now 3-2. Three and two. Pretty good spot there on that slider, just up, maybe a bit out. One hopper off the chest, Sefcik knocks it down and then bobbles it. He went to the glove there to pick it up, needed to go to the bare hand. Went to the glove and then couldn't regain a handle on it. An error opens up the bottom of the ninth inning. And gives Xavier some life. Jared Cushing at the plate. It's the guy we've been talking about. Could not be a bigger spot for the man with a six hit weekend against UConn recently. Tried to make it a one run game on that swing. He sure did, out of his shoes. Saw the breaking ball up and just missed it. 0 for 3 night. Way up. That one slipped. Now the rain has stopped here at Prasco Park. You have to wonder if Sefcik got just a wet spot there on that ground. Even Mitchell on that most recent pitch. Fires back to the hard stuff there to make it two and two. 91. One of the harder pitches for Mitchell tonight. That's at his top end that I've seen all year. He's got the juices flowing for sure in this big game. Fly to right, Viterick back, still going back, and he's got it lined up. Right field, where balls go to die. One out in the ninth inning. Right field at Prasco tonight has been less about the hits and a lot more about that concession stand. Great concession stand, by the way. Top notch. A plus. All the good things about Prasco's concessions. It's as good as free. <laughs> That's right. Free fitty. That is unbelievable. Everything here is free. Free parking, free entertainment, free admission, free food. I'm going to sleep here. <laughs> good for the game of baseball, that's for sure. Spreading the game. A lot of kids here running around enjoying the ball game. This reminds me of the park from Sandlot. Oh, yeah. If you build it, they will come and eat. Field of dreams, you mean. Ground ball over to third base. Cross cuts it off on the run and in time. Two outs in the ninth inning. No, Sandlot. Not Sandlot. What movie am I thinking of? If you build it, they will come. That's Field of Dreams, no? Yeah, but they've used that in another movie as well. Bench warmers. Bench warmers. <laughs> yeah. That's what this park That's reminds right. me of. Now two outs in the ninth inning, Xavier. Down three runs. Man at second base. 
And it's up to Aiden Anderson. Anderson had the two-run home run last inning. Down nothing and two. Cincinnati lost to Xavier on February 27th. They play again next week. Bearcats trying to join Miami as winners in this year's Joe Nuxall Classic. One and two. Anderson takes outside. Good leave. It's a great. tough take, but it's a great take. He knows he's not going to do much with that. Two two for Mitchell. Check swing off the outside edge and no swing. Now the count is full. Payoff pitch, and it's popped up. Right near home plate, Jones tosses the mask. Mitchell calls him off and nobody makes the play. And that is a foul ball. Mitchell called off Jones and then nobody made the play. Very rare to see the pitcher calling off the catcher in that situation, but let's not forget Mitchell's a shortstop. He's going to call everybody off and try to go get the ball, and it looks like he just lost it at the last second, overran it. Nearly landed in fair territory. Strike three calls. That ends the ball game, and Cincinnati wins the nightcap of the Joe Nuxall Classic 5-2. to two. Over the Xavier Musketeers, Mitchell punches out Anderson to end it. And Cincinnati joins Miami, Ohio as winners in this year's Joe Nuxall Classic. Christian Mitchell continues to be big time out of this Cincinnati bullpen. Steps up, two inning save. And it was all Bearcats tonight despite the Musketeers bottom of the eighth two run effort. Bearcats continue their hot streak. So Cincinnati comes away with the win after losing to Xavier earlier this year. Bearcats take this one. And they will have one more game against one another this year. That is next Wednesday. Cincinnati will be on the road against Oklahoma State in Big 12 play. Xavier is home against Creighton this weekend. Oh, nice win for the Bearcats, who have now won four games in a row. And like you said, Zach, that is a big RPI win against the Xavier team. We'll send it down to the field. Paul Frischner is with Cincinnati Player of the Game. With Josh Cross, three for five today, a couple of runs scored, a run driven in. First of all, congratulations on the win. Take me through tonight's game. Yeah, so uh, we know that they beat us last time when we were at third place, and we just wanted to come back and get the dub. So. Personally for you, how do you feel like you played tonight? Uh, could have been better, uh, a little more discipline at the plate, but um, other than that, I think we all played good as a team. There's no me. Josh, congratulations. Appreciate it. Paul, thank you, Josh. Josh Cross tonight. Had a three for five game. He drove in a run in the first inning. And the Bearcats win it by a score of five to two. Anderson provided the only offense for the Musketeers with a two run home run. Cincinnati two runs in the first inning. 
Two in the fourth and one in the seventh, and that was all they needed tonight to hold off Billy O'Connor's Xavier Musketeers. Any final thoughts, Zach? Like if you're just talking to the kid. Coming into this game, we knew it was going to be whether or not UC could continue their hot streak against TCU. It's going to come down to the pitching, and the pitching held up. Bearcats continue to impress. Ten punch outs, just two walks from their pitching staff. Offense doing what we know the offense is going to do. And in a rivalry game that means so much to so many people in Cincinnati, UC is going to take this one. So the Bearcats win it by a score of 5-2. to two. Miami, Ohio won earlier in the night, 22 to 21. And in this year's iteration of the Joe Nuxhall Classic, no tournament style, no trophy will be awarded due to inclement weather for the first round of games. So co-winners this year, Cincinnati and Miami of Ohio. For Zach Siegel and the entire crew here with Chatterbox, Anthony Mazzini signing off. It's been a presentation of the Joe Nuxhall Classic on Chatterbox Sports. Thanks for tuning in. And enjoy the rest of your Tuesday night in the Cincinnati area. For years, Presco has been a leading pharmaceutical company in the United States. And though we were founded in 2000,